All right, we're here with uh, Isaac and uh, Tyler Blake Hook and myself. So we're putting together a talk on threshold deontology, and uh, I'm really, uh, really excited for this. So I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm Avi. I'm a vegan medical doctor interested in philosophy and normative theories, and uh, I'm with uh, Isaac and Tyler Blake Hook. And uh, we're going to talk about threshold deontology. Uh, I'll let uh, Tyler introduce himself. Uh, our guest, uh, well, actually, before that, sorry, I'll let Isaac introduce himself, and then we'll introduce Tyler. No, I don't know why I have any kind of priority here. Um, I mean, I mean, it'll, it'll be guest on, comes it'll last. Be <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm Isaac. Ask yourself. I have a YouTube channel. I talk about philosophy, ethics, stuff like this. All right, Tyler, take it away. Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm Tyler Cook. Uh, I'm a uh, fourth year P. Am I my fourth year? Yeah, I'm a fourth year PhD student uh, in philosophy at Ohio State. Um, I uh, did my undergrad at the University of Georgia, and my master's degree at Arizona State University. And it was around the time of when I was working on my master's degree that I was started thinking about these issues with uh with threshold deontology. I was really interested in normative ethical theory, and I got interested in threshold deontology or moderate deontology, as it's sometimes called. Uh, yeah, when I was doing my master's degree at Arizona State. So I'm excited to, to talk about this stuff with everybody today because it's been a while since I've looked at some of these uh, issues with threshold deontology, and it's really cool and exciting stuff. So I'm excited to talk about it. All right, awesome. So where do we begin? I think this is really interesting because, um, like we were talking about before, we, so, and by we, I mean Isaac and I, we've sort of been thinking about what are the things we care about and what normative theory best captures the things that we're caring about. And we realized that we didn't really have a name for it because it didn't fully fit into uh, consequential, well, quote unquote, consequentialism or utilitarianism. It didn't really fit into rule utilitarianism. Um, and it didn't fit into deontology either, um, but it did fit into some kind of hybrid between the two. And where it all came back for me was a trolley problem kind of situation where I don't think I would kill one to save two or three or four or five, but I would at some point if you kept sliding the number up. Don't know exactly when, but if it reached 50,000, yeah, I probably would. 100,000, yeah, I definitely would. And so I don't think, I think there was some sort of threshold, if you will, and that turns out to be actual and normative theory um, that captures that view, threshold deontology. Now, there are, of course, nuances to that, but and, and I'm excited to get into them. So, yeah, can I could I just ask a quick question? Yeah, quick sure. Question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you say that whenever you realized initially that your uh, that your view didn't fit neatly within like rural consequentialism or rural utilitarianism or deontology, I guess you were thinking at that point of just a kind of absolutist deontology that it wouldn't fit under under that kind of. Kind of oh no, even theory. even I think even like a and but by absolutist you mean Kantian as opposed to like Russian or like what do you? Yeah, yeah, something that like, you know, constraints can never be permissibly violated. Like you can never permissibly violate somebody's right to life or something like that. Yeah, I was so I was thinking sort of like Kantian, but even with Russian, um, I, I understand that, for example, Russian, deon Russian deontology, like some some rules or some duties can supersede others. And so some more refined versions of deontology, you can have a rule that is more important than another rule to follow. But even, I think even that didn't fully, so that captures my view better, I'll grant that, but I still don't think it fully captures my view. Um, and the reason for that is because I still think that there are certain, I still think that for any rule that you bring to the table, I think at some point, whatever rule you bring can theoretically be superseded by a utility on the other side of the scale, a, a, util a utility differential on the other side of the scale if you scale up that utility differential high enough. And barring- do you not, Sorry, do you not think that Ross can capture that sort of uh, view? So he can, you know, the way I think he can capture that view, the only way, well, the only, I could be wrong about this, but one of the ways I think he can capture that view is by introducing utility, basically introducing utilitarianism as a rule, more or less, by saying it's a rule to improve utility. Um, or, But barring any of the moves, so yes, you can do that, but 
it's considered like if if you do that it's like i call there's something and i can't quite articulate it what it is but there's something unsettling about these types of moves so the following moves i find to be a little bit unsettling when a when a consequentialist basically cashes out consequentialism in terms of deontology in terms of rule following when a a deontologist captures utilitarianism or consequentialism in terms of utility or when like a virtue ethicist will say like well it's virtuous to improve utility or it's virtuous to follow rules or things like that and the reason i find them like i almost call them sort of meme moves the reason i find them a bit like disheartening is because the whole the whole point of these different normative theories is to to se separate things out from each other and yes you can capture them but like i guess I, it's just there's something about that that seems meme -y. and all i'm saying is that barring those moves i don't know how russ can capture that if he wants to be okay with that type of move saying like okay well it's a rule to be sort of a utilitarian i guess like fine yeah go ahead yeah, I was going to say, I, I mean, it seems to me that he already has this rule, right? I mean, he has mm -hmm. the prima facie duty of beneficence. So uh, one thing Ross says is like, for example, uh, so he thinks we have a, a duty of non-maleficence, as he calls it, right? So you, you know the picture of the prima facie duties, right? It's like they're not absolute. You don't always have to follow them because they can conflict in interesting ways and some might outweigh others in certain situations. And this, so he has this kind of picture of thing. And I think, you know, he's motivated really by this thought that like there can be conflicts of duties and like, what do we do whenever duties conflict? Like if we think that duties are absolute, then it's like, no matter what we do, we're going to do the wrong thing whenever they conflict because we can only follow one of them. Right. So, I mean, that's the kind of cool thing about his picture is it gets, you know, to, to say that, you know, some duties are more stringent than others. But I mean, I think, you know, Ross just thinks that like, look, when we reflect on like what, what, what matters to us fundamentally, the things that seem to matter to us and what seem to be morally salient, it seems like uh, one thing we should be doing is not harming others. Like it's, it's, it's bad to harm other individuals, right? But another thing that seems pretty intuitive is that it's good to benefit others. It's a good thing whenever, whenever you can make other people uh, more well off, right? So then the thought seems to be that while it's normally the case that if you could either um, – not harm someone or sorry if you could if you could harm someone and it would you know create some beneficence somewhere else or you can not harm them and you would miss out on that beneficence i think ross sort of argues that non-maleficence is, is is typically more stringent so you shouldn't you right. should harm others in order to benefit others so i think in, in a way in a way ross's theory some people have thought that ross's theory really does undergird uh a kind of threat it kind of has a kind of threshold dance mm -hmm. to do it um, so at least um, some so have thought that way. Real quick, Tyler, do you, do you think there is a any meaningful distinction between Ross's um, prima facie duty of beneficence as opposed to just utility simpliciter? Or is beneficence just utility simpliciter in the sense that we ought do, when someone says we ought do things that are beneficent, uh, do they mean we ought improve, we ought improve utility? Or is there any sort of distinction between those two? So I'm not a Ross expert exactly, so I'm not sure exactly what he has in mind. But I would say at least seems plausible to think that whenever uh, whenever you think, you know, whenever someone says like, oh, you should be beneficent toward others, the th thought seems to be like, oh, well, you, you know, you have a duty to make others more well off whenever you can, whenever it wouldn't be a great sacrifice to you. You know, just generally speaking, it's nice to be nice to people, right? It's nice to increase others' well-being whenever you can. And that sounds like a kind of utilitarian-like consideration. Okay. I don't, I don't have a view on that myself. So if what I'll say is just, if beneficence really does just reduce to utility, then I agree. It, it, Ross just has several different rules. And one of those rules is to in, increase utility. Um, hey, can, if one thing, sorry, let me just say one thing that you might not like about Ross's view though, is that, I mean, one thing Ross says is that whenever a duty is in play, like it's in play. And if nothing is conflicting with it, like you have to follow that duty, right? Mm -hmm. So some, one thing you might think, and I think some authors have pointed this out before, I'm not sure, but I mean, it definitely strikes me as uh, important to think about, is like you might think that like we're always in a position to benefit others like there's always things we could be doing like i could be volunteering at the soup kitchen right now or you know or doing something or else yeah or giving them a, like i'm always in a position to be benefiting people and in a way that might make ross's theory 
actually really demanding in a utilitarian like way like you know there's these demanding this objections against utilitarianism you might sort of pose that same kind of objection to ross because you might think that like he says whenever the duties are in play you know they're in play and you ought to follow them if they're not you know conflicting with others so it seems that if you think that you're always in a position to be beneficent toward others then like you're always going to have to be being beneficent as long as it's not harming others or as long as it's not being unfair to others and things like that right so Right. And obviously I do find that demanding. There are ways that, so we've thought about this as well. And I think there are ways that you can separate, you can have some principled way of separating, although it's not easy, but there may be some ways to have a principled way of separating what is good versus, or, or virtuous versus what is not only good and virtuous, but obligatory. But that's a, a bit of a different conversation. Yeah, I um, think what I'm might want to cover some, some of the more basic kind of stuff before you're ending up somewhere like that. We should just start. Uh, do you want to start with the graph and just go through it um, based on like what yeah, what I, we do? I, value. I, yeah. I, I do. I also I just had a quick question about beneficence on um, Ross's view. Is that actually taken to be the sort of highest rule? No, uh, -uh. I, it's like no. I think the idea is like the the duties have different like degrees of stringency, and he thinks beneficence beneficence is important. But normally, like, it's more important to keep a promise uh, than to, you know, benefit others. If you could break a promise to maybe slightly benefit others, then you shouldn't break the promise. So beneficence is morally important on his view, but it's not by any means, like, more important than the other principles. Yeah, and I take it that non-malfeasance also supersedes beneficence generally, all things considered equal on, on Russian's view? That's on right. View. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hey, can I, can I just ask a quick question? Is my volume okay? Sometimes I'm, like, loud. Yeah, you're, you're perfect, actually. Okay, I get really excited when I talk about philosophy sometimes. I, get, <laughs> I, I might be too loud. So I'm sorry if I get loud, but... No, you're um, good. No, you feel free to just scream at us about Ross or whatever. Wait, awesome. Uh, what if, if you don't, Bryn's trying if to say you something here? Yeah. yeah if, if you don't mind, I'll just hop in because it's... <clears throat> there's a there's a common sort of critique of the way that Ross poses well, the just, let's idea. Just, let's just ask Chris because well, Ty, Ty did come in here expecting two people. Bry, Bryn's also great to talk to you. Are you comfortable with a third or would you rather keep it to just two here? What? I said oh, one quick thing. To, I said yeah, one quick thing to say. That's fine. Well, well, just one second. Let's just just out of respect for the guests. Do you have any preference there, Ty? No, as many people as want to talk, I'm I'm cool with that. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Sorry, yeah, go go ahead, Sophia. Yeah. So so basically, in this community, we've used the notion of protonto reasons quite uh, quite a lot, and there's a sort of a like recent um, discussion that instead Ross should have used protonto notions. So if you use like protonto instead of prima facie. The question that you you had there sort of blows up. He's basically just saying these are like the immediate reasons or the reasons that are not themselves like categorical or not all things considered. So they're just sort of things that add into our moral calculus, but they're, they're not quite like the highest level as as Ty said. And so there's at least a few authors who have said that yeah, Protonto, which is something like Avi in particular uses quite a bit, is a better way to think about some of those affairs. Yeah, that's right. Are you referring to like Shelley Kagan's uh, discussion of this issue? Yeah, Kagan, Kagan has, and I think a few others have mentioned that uh, if we like were to modernize like Rossian ethics, we, we would instead use the term protonto, like that fits better into our current understanding of things. Yeah, that seems right, right. And I guess and part of what I was wondering there, so non-malfeasance is also not taken to be like the highest um, rule here, correct? Yeah, I think that's right. But look, I think it's really going to depend on context. I mean, I think that Ross is going to say that in a situation in which you could slightly harm someone and really benefit millions of people, I think he's going to want to say, like, look, context is really important to Ross. I think he's going to want to say that, look, these duties can vary depending on these contextual factors. They can vary in their in their in their stringency and, you know, and their severity or their, you know, their degree of uh, moral importance. Because I think what Avi and I are going to say or are going to want to say is like, if malfeasance and beneficence are construed such that, you know, as far as we can tell, we're just talking about utility, it's going to be like trivially easy in like the vast majority of cases, whenever a non utilitarian value is put up against, let's use non non malfeasance here to just scale up the, um, the like malfeasance concern high enough and have that override whatever the value like i can't picture a situation where i'm going to care more about a promise than utility once you scale the utility concern up enough right yeah so it seems like i i would need to read more about it but that seems 
like on its face like a big concern like there's gonna have to be a lot of waiting on especially like well i guess i shouldn't say especially non-malfeasance but there's gonna be a lot there's whatever is kind of equivalent to utility in that system if there is something equivalent to utility it seems like it's gonna have a lot it's gonna need to have a lot of waiting because we find it pretty easy to generate situations where utility like outweighs these other kind of concerns i don't know how you feel about that yeah, sorry, you were saying, what was the last bit about? It's about the importance of a value, like non-maleficence, um, in um, Ross's system. I guess my concern yeah. is if the value isn't weighted, like, pretty highly, I think that the system is going to do a bad job of, like, mapping the kind of things that I care about, because I find it very easy to, like, scale up I, I just think in terms of utility really here, but like to scale up the utility concern and then have that become more important than preserving whatever the sort of deontological concern is. So it just seems like if we if we have some system where we don't directly talk about a utility concern, instead we talk in terms of beneficence and maleficence, um, you're gonna, and we talk about that as like a rule, you're gonna have to weight that rule like very highly such that it easily outweighs other concerns um yeah if that's you right map I think, what i care about at least yeah I, that's right I, I, like i said i think he does think that you know generally speaking that preventing harm is more important than, than benefiting others and i mean he even says in the right and the good i think this is in chapter two he says like look it's like the the data of ethics is just you know sort of our intuitions and the intuitions of you know you know everyone who's like part of the moral community and it's like that's what i'm intending to capture with this kind of normative ethical theory i mean it's it, it is a little difficult right because you might think that oh it sounds a bit descriptive what he's up to here but i think that he just really wants a theory that comports with sort of common sense moral judgments and moral intuitions and uh a lot of people have agreed that he does a pretty good job of doing that that he seems to capture common sense morality pretty well yeah and i think that so maybe we'll we'll move to this more thoroughly later because i think obvious i got a good idea about wanting to start by going through this visual representation we have of the system and seeing what you think of that um but one thing that would be interesting to get into uh would be whether there's some kind of problem with like a uh, talking about td just descriptively right like avi and i are going to take the view that like an anti-realist of basically any type can be a threshold deontologist if we alter the language appropriately like if you have um say that say that you don't really like you don't take it that there's like any kind of in metaphysically robust like moral properties out there you think there's just preferences or something like this like you could just say well td is just kind of a descriptive model for like mapping my preferences it's a way to quickly communicate the kind of things that i value um we're gonna want to say there's not a problem there maybe maybe you'll want to say there is but you could give us a few words on that but then let's let's cover some of the basic territory before we get to things like that yeah i think that that, that, that seems that seems right i mean in my thesis like at the time i was really attracted to this idea that like the content of morality is just like the intuitions and like preferences of the group. Right. And, mm -hmm. and like, I don't, I'm not so sure. I mean, I think my opinions have definitely changed over, you know, the past few years, but at the time, I think I was really attracted to the idea that like, Oh, you want to know where a threshold is or you want to know how important a constraint is. Well, just look what, look at what people on average think. Like look at what people <laughs> sort of tend to think. And like, that's, you know, I don't, I don't think that works in the end. I mean, that's something I flirt. That's an idea I flirted with. I mean, if you want to be a realist, if you want to be a more realist in a threshold deontologist, that's certainly not going to work. Cause you're not going to think that like people's intuitions just settle the matter. You're going to think there's some like, you know, attitude, independent truth, uh, you know, or fact of the matter about where the threshold actually lies or how serious it is but i mean i, I guess i mean you, you probably could be some kind of relativist and think that yeah threshold deontology is just a way of just like describing what people's you know uh thoughts are but then it wouldn't really you know in the end be a normative ethical theory in the sense that like it wouldn't say like here's what to do and it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about it like these are just the normative ethical facts you know a kind of robust more realist kind of position it wouldn't be something like that obviously right yeah yeah right of course it would be it's kind of it's kind of funny for one's normative ethic to become entirely descriptive but like as long as we kind of all agree that you know it's it it's fine to just say like look i don't have any robust metaphysical commitments here like i'm just talking about 
like if I say I'm a utilitarian, I'm just saying my values are best captured by utilitarianism, right? The kind of things that utilitarianism will prescribe as good, those are the kind of things that I'm going to have a preference for. It seems like just kind of trivial. Like you could do the same thing with threshold deontology. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, though, though I do suppose it seems to me that part of what it is to endorse a normative ethical theory is to think that like when other people are like violating that theory's demands, like they're doing something wrong. Uh, and it, and you might think that like when you endorse a normative ethical theory, you don't just think, oh, from my perspective, they're doing something wrong. But no, they're like really messing up in some way. That seems like a natural thought, but I, I, I'm not sure what you think about that. Mm, yeah, I guess it, it I don't know. I don't know exactly what to say about that. I guess it depends on how you think about normative ethics. I'm not sure I have anything useful to say there. So I, I guess what I don't want to get into is um, some some really technical conversation about whether we're still technically talking about normative ethics if we do something like that. I guess I just want to say that I don't... Okay, so the statement, like, my normative theory is threshold deontology. If you're not, um, if you're an anti-realist, maybe there's some kind of problem there with categorizing it as a normative theory. But the very close-by kind of statement of my preferences are accurately mapped by this kind of theory, that I don't think is going to be a problem. So, so like, I, I grant what you're saying, yeah. Using the word normative theory might be incongruent with that kind of like meta ethic sure but um just pointing to the same theory and making it clear that it's a kind of like attempt to describe your preferences or that you're attempting to describe your preferences when you make reference to it that i don't see a problem with yeah i think it would certainly be weird if someone was like hey i'm a utilitarian and guess what else it's i don't even care about happiness it doesn't it's not even something i'm concerned with but yeah we should maximize happiness like that seems like a weird thing to say um <laughs> I mean, I guess, well, well, I feel like we could get off in the weeds here. I guess, like, maybe a realist of some stripe could say that, like, there's just a complete separation between their, like, preferences and, and what is actually good, and they've somehow, like, deduced that um, utilitarianism is good, but they, like, <laughs> have, a, like, you know, a preference against it or something like that. Maybe you could have a view yeah. like that, but... Yeah, they could say that the truth of the normative ethical theory is like its truth isn't determined by their preferences. Like they would want to say that, but it would also it would seem weird if they were like if they're like, yeah, the truth of it is independent of my preferences, and also like I don't really care about ethics or you know like my preferences <laughs> don't line up with it, so I don't have ethical preferences anyway. I mean, you could be like that in principle. Like I mean, right. there are certain people you might think like in principle there could be people who know the moral facts but just don't care about them. This is actually a kind of a substantive dispute in metaethics about whether there could be such characters who say things like, I know torture is wrong, but I don't care about it. Uh, right. or I'm still going to torture. Like, yeah. It, yeah, Parfit it, a... thinks this, right? Like, he thinks you can have, right. like, like, a psychopath who's, like, aware of all the relevant moral facts and, like, just doesn't care. Right. This is related to a discussion about whether, so there's these theories called, like, judgment externalism and right. judgment internalism. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, these externalists think that, like, no, you don't have to be motivated not to do something to think that it's wrong. Like, no, you can just think that it's wrong and it doesn't have to, you know, uh, hook up with your motivational system at all. Yeah, I mean, my thoughts are a bit a bit blurry on this stuff, but I don't, I can't make any sense of like what an external normative reason is. It's like if you tell me like this is a loaded example, but what a contradiction is. Like I understand a contradiction is some proposition and negation in conjunction, um, but I can't like picture contradictory things i can't picture like a square circle now I, I don't i'm not saying that external normative reasons are contradictory so it's a kind of bad analogy but i it, the similarity is just that i can't picture the thing they're talking about i don't i don't really know what's meant by that so yeah i i, I have trouble with that kind yeah of idea. i mean i think mark schroeder is someone who i think makes this pretty vivid and in, in his book uh, slaves slaves of the passions i think it's called where he gives this example is like so so suppose someone wants to go to a party and they don't like dancing they just hate dancing it would be it would be strange to say that hey a reason for you to go to the party is that there's going to be dancing there like it doesn't seem like that's a reason for them at all because it doesn't like it doesn't really you know resonate with them it doesn't line up with their motivational system at all he takes like sort of cases like that to motivate internalism about like reasons and 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 sort of these normative judgments i'm not sure i'm yeah. not honestly i don't have a settled uh, uh opinion on this i think it's really interesting but i'm not i'm not entirely sure what i think about these issues yeah, like we we got into this recently. Like we had um, we had someone trying to make kind of trying to give an intuition pump, sort of like uh, if your kid doesn't want to go to the doctor, 
surely they're being irrational. And, you know, if you make the kid aware of all the relevant facts and they still don't want to go to the doctor, you know, surely they're being irrational. And, and I guess the, the, the effect here is supposed to be like, you're supposed to go, well, of course, like, obviously kids should go to doctors, so the kid must be being irrational. But you, you start, it's like the idea is it's supposed to prompt you to go, well, there, there must still be a reason of some sort that exists there. But when you think about it carefully, like, I have no clue what it would possibly mean to say that kid has a reason to go to the doctor, as therefore being irrational by, you know, not doing so if it's the case that given total information they don't have any kind of desire to go to the doctor that that just confuses me i don't know what someone's saying if they say something like that yeah well how, how about an amendment on it and say something like not only do they need total information but there has to be like a sound deliberative route from that information to like what they ought to do because you might have total information but you might make fallacious inferences on the basis of that information so you might think that what's going yeah. on with the kid is you might think that really fundamentally they are they would be motivated to go to the doctor if they only were making you know the right inferences that they should be making from the, all the relevant information uh, you know and connecting that with their preferences if only they could see mm -hmm. how that information favors their well being or something and maybe they care about that then maybe they they would be motivated to go and that you know then they could see it as a reason for them to go so I think internalists are going to want to say that in cases where someone I think at least one thing they might want to say is that in cases in which um, you might think that a person doesn't have a reason because you give them all the information and they still, you know, don't see it as a reason. You might think that they're not just they're not making the right inferences or they're not sort of engaging in deliberation in the right way in order to see that it's a reason that it actually does or it should reason it resonate with them. It should link up with their with their motivations. Now, see, I, I think that that just pushes the question back a step. Maybe maybe you can find a flaw in my thinking here. But OK, so the, initially the kid hasn't been given any kind of reasons. They don't want to go to the doctor. You, or they haven't been given any information. Sorry, they don't want to go to the doctor. Um, the parents give them full information um, and they still don't want to go to the doctor. The idea is like, okay, at that point, like, I don't know what it would mean to say they're being irrational. They don't have a reason. So then the reply is to say, oh, well, well wait, maybe there's, maybe they have um, all the information, but they haven't made certain inferences like from that information but i think that that's that's just remedied by saying like they know let, let's just grant in this example that they know all the entailments of what whatever they believe like whatever whatever inferential chains can be like built out of the propositions they take to be true or false or whatever they just they know all those entailments um so like if they know certain things about mathematics like they're gonna know everything that follows from those um from those um propositions they know about mathematics it just seems like you can raise the exact same problem if instead of saying you know if they know x and they still don't have a desire to go to the doctor i don't understand what it means to say they have a reason the exact same response right if they know x and all the entailments of x and they still don't have any desire to go to the doctor i don't know what it means to say that they have a reason to go right it seems like like all i need to do to deal with that is just like correct for pushing the question back a step by adding like this further kind of postulation that they know all the uh all the entailments of their beliefs yeah think, i get yeah. that and that that seems plausible to me that seems like a reasonable way of thinking about it i think like some again i, I don't have a settled opinion on this but i think that someone like uh, maybe like a Peter Railton or someone who thinks that like an idealized version of the subject, like they would regard it as a reason. And like, and if you think that that's like the right way to latch onto someone's reasons, then maybe then they could be said to have a reason. Like some people say that like, oh, your desires aren't actually what give you reasons for action. It's like your informed desires or your the desires you would have if you were like suitably idealized or something. If you knew what like what was good for you or something like that. Yeah, I know that I, I don't I don't yeah. think I buy into that at all, by the way. It seems very mysterious and, and very abstract to me. But some people would argue that, oh, an idealized version of yourself would see that it's good for you and would and would see that, you know, that you have a reason to do it. So actually you have a reason to do it because, you know, an ide a suitably idealized version of you would. Well, and, and it seems very likely question begging, don't you think? We'd have to explore what exactly someone means when they say that. But suitably idealized 
sounds like it just might mean someone who is responsive to the kinds of reasons that we're talking about, right? Yeah. Which, like, why can't, what's, what's the contradiction in positing an agent who's not responsible or responsive to those reasons? Um, yeah, and it and, might be a way of trying to sneak in certain values that you might think that are objective that anyone should have no matter what they think. Absolutely. Like, you might think the person yeah, that's who... What yeah, the person who just wants to count blades of grass all day, you might think, oh, an idealized type person might want to say, oh, well, uh, an idealized version of them wouldn't want to do that. They would see that like friendship and other activities are better for them. But it's just like, on what grounds would you think that that's the case? Unless you just think these things are somehow objectively valuable, no matter what, you know, a person's preferences are or something like that. Yeah, yeah. O okay, I we could we could go further down that pathway. But I think um, let's uh, I, I don't know what your time's like. So maybe we'll we'll go to the. Uh to the graph, Avi, if you have that thing. Yeah, sure. Thing. Okay, so this was a way that we wanted to describe what we like to cashed out to be um, at least our framing of threshold deontology. Um, so I posted this in general. Um, are you able to view this? Uh, yeah, let me go to it right now. Yeah. Let me know when you got that up. Okay, I see it. All right. And so what we decided, what we wanted here was um, to describe what the view is. Um, so on the y-axis, what we have is moral value of a given action. And on the x-axis, we have utility. Now, really, the label consequential is consequentialism I recognize should be utilitarianism here um, if we're talking about utility but that aside we can start with the most straightforward one here which is um, the C line uh, we take that to be consequentialism in this case it's really utilitarianism now if we look at the utilitarian line the red line what if an action a given action doesn't result in any difference in utility, then on the x-axis, we're at the zero. So where would we be on the y-axis? Well, that seems pretty straightforward that we would also be at zero because on a utilitarian view, if actions don't change utility either way, then it would have a neutral moral value. So the moral value wouldn't be a negative or positive, it would just be zero. Well, it Making could, sense uh, sorry, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I messed up. I accidentally opened another page. I didn't know if you could still hear me. You, um, sorry, you said that if an action doesn't have, if it doesn't have any benefit or harm, then it's neutral. On utilitarian. If I'm on saying utilitarian. on a util, yeah, I'm saying on a utilitarian view, if the an action doesn't change utility either way, then it would be neutral on a utilitarian view. Okay, but it could still be wrong, right? I mean, suppose you have another action option available to you that you don't perform that would maximize utility. If you if you opt for the action that's not going to have any uh, harm or benefit, then it is wrong to perform because sure, sure, yes. Yeah. So in, we're talking about a situation where if you just are deciding between all the available options and the difference between the options that you're looking at result in zero difference in utility, on a utilitarian view, the moral value of these options would be zero. Gotcha. Yeah, it would have it wouldn't be negative or positive. So we're we're with each other. We agree so far. I think so. Uh, I'm just trying. I'm just trying. Maybe I'm doing this the wrong way. I was understanding as moral value as like. So you're thinking like better or worse, right? I mean, maybe rightness or wrongness isn't the right way to think about this. Maybe it's more like a better or worseness kind of relation. I'm not sure the exact distinction. Um, is it are you what, taking, what's the I, how do are, you, are you taking better and worse to be categorical and or sorry uh, right and wrong to be categorical and like better and worse to be kind of like scalar like is that sort of the idea yeah i guess that's normally how people think about it because i was just wondering like if again like if you have a number of action options available to you and like they all would have the same net benefit maybe they all would you know benefit three and harm three then like you know they're all equally right like they're all equally permissible and they're all like neutral i guess relative to each other neutral yeah they're yeah. all they're all right yeah, like any of the three actions would be right to perform yeah. because if you're just trying to maximize utility they're all the same yeah i ju i'm just taking um so this is a, a so yeah so something could be right or wrong but things could have different levels of rightness or wrongness 
Um, so I take the, these things to be, if we discuss the question of whether something is right or wrong, that would be a categorical question. If we discuss how right or how wrong it is, that would be a continuous variable, um, meaning like there's different degrees. Um, and then it, it, with respect to the relative versus absolute utility, which I which you were getting at before, um, for simplistic sake, we could just be taking like it in a vacuum. So let's just say there's, I mean, we, we could address multiple different actions as well. We can like frame this as a relative choice between others. And we could just say there's no utility difference for the sake of the argument. Or we can just say like we're hypothetically dealing in a vacuum where there's only one, one action. And that action results in like some amount of utility, positive, negative, or neutral. Well, like we could do, we could uh, go either route. I, I think that part of the, the problem Ty was raising there, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I think he was suggesting that there's like variants of utilitarianism where you won't be able to assign any kind of moral weighting without having two um, actions to compare. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Then we take the latter out. Then, then, then we can just say that we have two act two two choices, and they both result in the same amount of utility differential. Yeah, because it's probably a, a lot to to take in at once. Um, but like, I think that the utilitarian line there we're there's a framing of it that'll work if we're talking about a kind of utilitarianism that's like necessarily contrastive like that um so if we want to talk about i don't know if there's proper words for this in philosophy but if we want to talk about some kind of like non-contrastive utilitarianism where you can just talk about the moral goodness of some state of affairs based on the level of utility present we can obviously represent that but if you want to with with the line we've got there but if you want to say that we have to take a kind of contrastive approach or, or at least to say that we're talking about any type of utilitarianism here we have to be able to cover those types i think we can do the same thing with um what we've got here i think that you can just talk about the differential between two states of affairs having some level of utility, either you know neutral, positive, or negative, and that corresponding to um, kind of a rightness or wrongness to the action. Yeah, so certainly I think it's true that a utilitarian is going to want to say, insofar as like, so let's just take like classical act utilitarianism, for example, like hedonistic act utilitarianism. They're going to say like one state of affairs is obviously better than another to the extent that like it has more net pleasure, you know, being instantiated or whatever in, in that state of affairs. I guess w what I was a little confused about was like whenever a utilitarian has like multiple action options available to them, only one if we suppose that they all have different net you know net pleasure that would be brought about or whatever like only the one that's going to bring about the highest net utility is the right action and and every other action is just wrong there's no degrees of right right. wrongness here oh i see what you're saying yeah, it's um, like the concern about it being like like a relative kind of thing right because you don't you don't want to say in virtue of this state of affairs having um higher than neutral utility it's always good on utilitarianism because if there's some kind of utilitarianism that considers situations like relative to each other you could have two options both of which are utility maximizing but one to a greater degree than the other and therefore that first situation we talked about despite maximizing utility would actually be like the bad choice is that kind of yeah what, yeah yeah i think what yeah. you meant to say is that they could both be utility promoting but only one of them is utility maximizing. That is only one sure. of them is going to result in the state of affairs with the most sure. pleasure. So then you might have a case in which you have two states of affairs with large amounts of pleasure, you know, in both states of affairs. But if, if an action, you know, if you're considering a set of actions and like, you know, different actions are going to bring about different states of affairs, only the one that's going to bring about the most pleasure is the right action. And the other ones are just wrong. But they would be different, differing degrees of wrong, right? Well, some of the wrong actions might be worse than others, if that's what you're right. saying. So if you, yeah. an act, if you brought about a state of affairs with a lower utility than another one, but it's still not the maximum or the optimal amount, then like, yeah, that would still be wrong, but it might not be worse than the one in which you bring about even less pleasure. Like, obviously, right. like, the concern is like, if the graph is like, like, like if there's fixed values on the um, x-axis, like, oh, how, how do I say this? It's like, you don't, the, no, you I understand know, what's being said here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, it's just an issue. Yeah, but that's but the but the that's just an issue of the point of origin. Like you could always just change the point of origin on the graph just to reflect that. So you can say, well, this is the right action, and all other actions are just differenti differ, uh, differentiatingly, uh, or sorry, variably different values of negative in on the y-axis. Then that would just be shifting the the axis, in, um, shifting the 
the graph such that the point of origin is is measured differently. Yeah, I, I don't so know if this the, will help at all, but I mean, another way of maybe, I don't, again, I don't know if this is, will help, but like I, another way of thinking about like the act consequentialist view, the act utilitarian view, it's just like, like rightness and wrongness is just like binary, right? It's like the action is either right or it's wrong. And again, the thought is that like some actions might be worse than others, but they're all wrong if they're wrong at all, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it, And there's just one right action and it's not more right than any other action. It's just the one right action. <laughs> Well, I think the question of whether something is right or wrong is binary. I think the question of how right or wrong something is not binary. I think that is a continuous variable. One way to another way to cash this out. So there's, I think there's two ways to cash it out. One way is you can just it's point out it's an issue of just where the origin is on the graph, which is fine. That happens all the time. The other thing is just to say like, okay, well, we can just label the y-axis, which it is labeled the moral value of a given action, and whatever has the highest moral value, whichever action has the highest moral value, is the right thing to do. That's another. That would be another approach. Yeah, among you, among like among a set of action options, which everyone. Yeah, among a set of action best. options, whatever gives the highest moral value is the action that is the right action to do. Yeah, so like yeah. you take three yeah. discrete. Yeah, you could take like three discrete points on the graph that all um, are generating like more utility than disutility, and then the algorithm to like choose which is right is just which is maximizing utility to the greatest degree so you can you can notice they're all utility promoting um but then notice one is the most utility promoting and then therefore that one gets to be the good one so so in this case if we look at the graph if we take the so looking at the c line if we take that top right most point to be the end of the line like suppose it doesn't go any further like that's just the right action and all the other actions along that line are, are just wrong like, yeah, is that how or, you're yeah. or if there were discrete points, they would be like vertical lines on this and say you had three discrete points, whichever has the highest um, like like Y coordinate on that C line would be like the yep. good one. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Good. Yeah. And it would be the right choice in virtue of being on the highest Y, uh, having the highest Y value, which is moral value of a given action. So which means so so whichever action produces the highest moral value is the quote unquote right action to perform yeah, and that'll okay work yeah. if you're... I, that's that makes more sense to me now so then that is, when i'm understanding that c line it's just like okay there's a bunch of actions that could be along that line and then in any given case it's just like only a certain amount of those are going to be available to you like you can only per, you know produce a certain amount of well-being in a given case it's like whichever one's the highest along that line like that's the right one and then this moral value idea is like some of those are worse than that one and all the ones that are worse are like you know they're wrong and that one's just the right one the ones to the most right yeah, but you you and you yeah. another, got another like important element of it, which is like it's it's a big continuous graph that just goes on forever. But we can talk about situations where you have a choice of being at any point on the graph, or we can talk about situations where the options are like these seven discrete vertical you know points or, or, or lines or whatever. It's like which which is the best. So yeah, whether you're talking about you know the space of like all possible actions or just like narrowing it down to some options like you can still do the same kind of calculation to find like which actions which action is uh the best one yeah it, it, it seems obvious to me now now that we're talking about this way so sorry sorry if that was obvious but now now, now it, it does no, make it's, sense it's all good i think it's a, I think <laughs> a very worthwhile little set of concerns to raise there because you know we, we do want to make it clear that like we're not we're not just talking about certain types of utilitarian like i think you can talk about all the kinds of utilitarianism with a graph roughly like this you might just have to make a few little tweaks but yeah let's um oh sorry sorry yeah i was gonna say i mean i was gonna say suppose that like you're thinking of an act utilitarian type person mm -hmm. you're gonna want to say like i was saying earlier uh if you have just a few dots along the line uh, that are available to you if you represent those as your action options then obviously the one that's most to the right is the right one to do but i mean even if you're kind of like satisficing type person so you know satisficing consequentialists say that you don't have to maximize utility right you just have to do enough so then there might be a case in which there's multiple dots along that line and maybe there's two or three uh, over to the right and they all do enough to count as right so any of those would be right would be the right action to perform You're like those, all of those are permissible but then all the ones to the left or it would be wrong so even then you could have like that line representing a kind of satisfying exactly. consequence view but then the, the idea is like no matter the consequentialist view in question like no, or let's say no matter the utilitarian view in question as long as is, is as long as it's well-being that we're concerned with it's always going to be the case that like the action is going to get better the more right it moves that's definitely true exactly like because 
the the graph is always going to look the same what you're talking about is is basically like the kind of algorithm to like interpret uh the graph right like to yeah like do we say that anything past some kind of vertical like satisficing line is good or do we say just the furthest right point available is good like like those aren't questions that would involve actually like changing what the graph looks like it's just about how we want to interpret it given our particular form of utilitarianism that's right that's just the difference in the different kind of utilitarianisms how they understand where yes. the rightness falls on the graph exactly it's not it's not actually none of, none of those um versions of utilitarianism would actually necessitate changing the graph at all just how we think about yeah they it. yeah exactly they wouldn't deny it they're committed to saying that you know the, the the better the consequences you know the more the good and the consequences the better you know it is so they would all agree with this upward trend okay it sounds like we're aligned on this do you want to go on to the other lines Avi? lines Avi? yep yeah we can go to the uh d line now all right so you still got it pulled up ty yep okay so the d line would represent deontology um and for the sake of simplicity, we could go on to Russian, but for the sake of simplicity, well, we could go to Russian and we can we can frame it as Kantian or Russian, but we can deal with this uh, as w where beneficence is not simplicity or utility. Um, so we or so let's. I think we maybe we should we can just start with. Um, actually, no, I think we should we could do Russian. So D we can represent as um, Russian deontology in which with, with just the understanding that we're not talking about beneficence being equivalent to utility, right? So here's what D represents. The D line represents the moral value of violating a rule, right? So it's not the moral value of following a rule, what the D value represents is the moral value of violating a rule. And there could be different lines with different where, where those lines are that uh, have different values. So not obviously not all rule violations can carry equal weight. But let this let's just say we violate a given particular rule. Doesn't matter which one. It could be represented higher to the uh, less negative or more negative. They'll all carry some sort of negative moral value if you violate a rule. Now you'll notice that, let's say what happens when we're at the origin? When we're at the origin, the utility produced by that um, rule violation is zero. It didn't change utility either way. However, the rule has still been violated. And so the D value uh, the, is, on the, uh, as far as the y, y coordinate is, is in the negative, which makes sense because while you haven't increased or decreased utility, you have still committed a rule violation. Now, if your rule violation produced a lot of utility, you'll notice that the moral value of performing that rule violation is still, um, is still in the negative and just as much in the negative because we are constructing D as a form of deontology that doesn't cash out a rule um, that doesn't um, that doesn't cash out the rule as where beneficence is utility simpliciter. Um Is that making sense so far? Ty? Um, hmm. I wonder if we had some kind of tech issue there. Uh, can, can you, you hear, hear me, Ty? Yeah. Oh, me? yeah, now we, now we have him. Were you able to hear Avi there? Sorry, did you lose me? We did for a second. We did. Oh, I was just, I was, I was just trying to say that, um, so D just, D is just absolute ontology, right? Right. Um, I don't know. See, the, what's he making me hesitant of saying it's absolute deontology is I still think there, um, I want to represent D in a way that there could, the different rules can still carry different, um, negative value weightings. So okay. I would say so like different, uh, different absolutist rule, like like the constraint against murder is more stringent than the constraint against lying. So they're both yeah. absolute. Like one's worse. So than they're one though they're both, idiot. and by absolute we just mean they're always they're always um, they're wrong irrespective of the utility produced by it. 
Yeah, they can never be permissibly violated or broken. Unless, well, they 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 can be permissible. They can never be per permissibly violated unless it's in contrasted with a different rule, basically. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so that's what it, what I mean by by that D line over there. So it's it's some sort of, um, it's some sort of it's a de it's a deontic it's a deontic system in which the rule violations carry negative moral value irrespective of the utility produced. And so they are wrong unless they are contrasted by a, a more weighty rule that you would be following or in accord with. Okay, I see. I just, a quick observation here. I think like it, it, it is interesting because like this, the, the way you're talking about absolutist ontology is interesting because I guess you could, you could have an absolutist ontological theory that says uh, different, you know, rights violations or different constraints have different degrees of, you know, se seriousness or stringency. Um, and whenever they conflict, like you should, you know, respect the more serious one. But you should never, if there's, if there's ever just one in play, you should never violate it for the sake of, you know, producing some good consequences. Like that's interesting that you put it that way because I think normally, like people think about Kant's dance logical theory, like that's just like the paradigmatic absolutist theory. And he thought, I think, uh, I mean, I think there's sort of differences in Kant interpretation here, but I think, I think he does say something like he thinks that there would never, in principle, there could never be conflicts of duty. And so we would never get this, we would never even need to sort of reflect on this question of like how seriousness, you know, or how serious different, you know, rights or constraints might be. So it's interesting that, that you put it this way, because I think that's certainly a coherent, like absolutist way of doing things uh, is to be absolutist, but also think that the different rights might have different degrees of stringency. Anyway, I just wanted to make that observation there. Yeah. I mean, if someone wants to point out the contradiction with the duties um, conflicting each other, I invite them to do so. I mean, I guess they'd have to define the duties in terms of each other somehow, but in any case, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's clear on what the, the D line means. So, so yeah, so it makes sense why the D line, regardless of whether the utility, um, where utility, the utility produced by the action is, um, it's still wrong, uh, to a certain degree, uh, to the same degree, actually to violate that rule. Um, and so, and each, and the D line could be more or less negative depending on what rule that is. Okay. So we're on this same page about the, the red line. We're on the same page about the blue line. And uh, so then we can move on to the, the T line or the threshold deontology line. All right, we're on the same page so far. Yeah, I think so. I have some things I'm thinking about, but I want to let you finish because I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Uh, sure. I want to press them yet. <laughs> okay, cool. So with the T line or the threshold deontology line, you'll notice that the, um, the where the T line is at zero, so not the origin of the graph, but where the T line has, a, has zero moral value, it, where, where the action is neutral is exactly where is exactly the difference, the same difference between the D line and the C line. So if it's where the consequences, the value, the moral value of the consequences and the moral value of the rule violation equally balance each other out. Where that is, is where the T line will be at z have zero moral value. The, it would say the T, the threshold deontologist would say that that action has has a neutral moral value it has a neutral moral value at the point where the moral value of the consequences and the moral value of the rule violation equally balance each other out at the origin where the cons where the there is a rule violation so we're at the origin of the graph now where there is a rule violation and where the action produces no utility, the threshold deontologist would say that that is a, that would have a negative moral value. That would be, and they would categorize it as wrong um, because you're violating a rule and there's no consequences that outweigh that rule violation. The, we already discussed the neutral point. As you scale up the consequences, when you start saying that, okay, we're violating a rule, but the consequences are getting um, more favorable. In other words, they're getting more morally, uh, having more moral value. So let's say you're killing someone, but you're saving lives and you're scaling up the amount of lives you're saving. At some point you hit the, that zero point where the consequences balance out, equally balance out the rule violation. And then further along the line, when the consequences build up more and more, where you save, let's say you save more and more people. At some point, the T line becomes positive. 
That is to say, the, t the threshold deontologist would look at the action and say, it has a positive moral value. And the reason it has a positive moral value is because the moral value of the consequences is now outweighing the moral value of violating the rule in question. Are we with each other? Are you we're following so far? Yeah. So like the nice thing about the visual mapping, well, there's probably a few nice things about it, but you can kind of see like the T line is just the C line offset by the distance between the horizontal line and the D line, right? So like say that we're picturing some uh, some deontic wrong. Let's, let's just take it that lying is a deontic wrong in, in this context. Um, now say that we're going to take like a series of possible worlds that each have the same lie told in them, but the effect on utility, um, varies across this series of worlds, right? So you can see like by looking at the graph in the worlds where utility is negative and the lie is told, you have this like amplifying effect where the T line ends up below the C and the D line, right? It's, it's consequentially bad and it's deontically bad. That, that's really not good. At the, uh, the intersection on the graph, you can see there's some point where consequentially the lie is neutral, right? It's, it's the effects of, of telling it there's just no impact on utility, but it's still a lie. So the action is still bad, even when on consequentialism alone, it would be neutral. Then, you know, you move further along and you can see that there's an area where despite the consequences being positive and therefore the lie being good on consequentialism, there's still this deontic offset, right? Where it turns out being negative. But at some point, the consequences become good enough that the deontic offset just leads you to neutrality. And then if you just keep making the consequences better and better and better, that offset Although it, it does result in you saying the action isn't as good as it would be on pure consequentialism, you still end up saying it's good despite there being, you know, kind of like a pro tanto consideration against it. Yeah, so, okay. Um, so, Avi, tell me if this is, tell me if this is uh, accurate or is this capturing your understanding of the graph. So, with the T line, uh, before it gets to um, to the x-axis there, like all of those actions are wrong, correct? Before it gets to the y value of, before it crosses the x-axis, is that what yeah, you're asking? Yeah, before, yeah, yeah, before that line like reaches the x-axis and then, you know. So what I would say is that back. on the threshold deontic view, I would say all of those actions prior to that point have a negative moral value. Now, and the reason I'm saying that is because I don't want to have some conflation of being, well, everything is wrong except for the, this view that everything is wrong except for the best possible action, or the action that, that has the most, the highest moral value. I'm just trying, the same thing we were discussing before. I'm trying to cash it out into moral value. And then whether your view of moral, moral value is a, a sufficiency one where it's like good enough, uh, one that they're all right and others are wrong or whether your your view of moral value is that only the action that has the highest possible moral value is the right one and all other actions are wrong um i want it to be it just the graph to still capture those different views and so i'm cashing it out in moral value um and whatever view you have on moral value translating to rightness or wrongness you could interpret that later okay that so sense? yeah yeah i think that makes sense so let, let, let me step back for just a second so Let's imagine we're, we're just taking an action like uh, uh, Isaac, would you say lying? Um, sure. Yeah. So let's just take lying. OK, now let's put lying on the C line. Right. It, the, the deontological aspect of it, it just doesn't even matter. Right. It's like, right. right. As soon as the well-being starts going up, the more value starts going up. The lying just doesn't make a difference. Exactly. Um, exactly. Right. And then we move that to the T line. Right. And then we see lying. It makes a big difference uh, right from the start. But we said we got to get a lot of well-being going before that that moral value goes positive. And then you're saying then we put lying on the D line and it's just always the same moral value, no matter the well-being or suffering involved. Is that how you want to think about? Yeah. That? Yeah. The, the only slight correction, at least that I can think of, is, is you said you have to have a lot of um, of utility before it becomes positive. Now, of course, I agree with the general thing you're saying there, but 
how much utility it needs that that's like a separate question maybe it doesn't take a lot of utility to for a lie to be okay but it takes a lot for like a genocide to be okay or something like that but right so so yeah so, I think so I, barring the word a lot yes I, I agree completely with everything you said yeah gotcha. yeah yeah because uh, yes, here's the awesome. thing ty like the, the, if we want to like so in this graph it, this actually is for murder like the d would be a, like a killing someone kind of thing but if we were to make it a lie instead we can cash it out in that graph it's just that the d line would be a lot less negative does that make sense and so it would require a lot less utility for the threshold deontologist to say it's okay yeah if the yeah so let is... me let I, I don't know how helpful this will be but let me just tell you what i was thinking for a minute while i was a little bit confused and i don't know if this will illuminate things at all but for a moment i was thinking that c the c line that's just what any plausible ethical theory would say. Namely, the more well-being minus suffering an action results in, the more moral value that action is going to have. And, and we're not talking about whether it's right or wrong. Like it could ha create a lot of well-being. It could be very high in moral value in terms of, you know, the well-being minus suffering that's produced by it. And almost any plausible normative ethical theory is going to say that, like, you know, better consequences, you know, well-being minus suffering is like good. And the more well-being minus suffering you could produce, you know, the higher the value of the action. But they could just disagree on like whether that makes a difference to the rightness or wrongness of the action. So for I was thinking that the C line could really just be any any plausible normative ethical theory but then when we start putting dots along the line and we want to talk about which action is right or wrong we have to talk about the nature of those actions so if you put if you just if you just focus your attention on the c line you can say hey i'm a threshold deontologist i think that the more well-being minus suffering that's produced by action the better it is but when i when i move along the c line and i put an action looks put it somewhere between c and t here i don't know just a little to the right of the c I might still think that action is wrong, even though it's high in moral value, because I might think that although it is high in moral value, there's this other thing, namely the intrinsic wrongness of the action, that's like counterbalancing that high moral value. That, uh, that And when we're talking about the moral value here, we're only talking about like it's instrumental goodness or something like this. Do you see why one might be confused if, if one thinks about it in that sort of way? Um, I guess. Of, yeah, I guess. Uh, so maybe this would... Maybe this will clear it up. So by by moral, the only reason I'm saying moral value instead of rightness or wrongness is just to avoid like one's view of how moral value translates to rightness or wrongness and whether it's yeah, binary yeah. or non-binary. I got it. Yeah. Got so it, yeah. so like a con so a consequentialist de facto, they would say like okay, so they would simply say like okay, whatever has more well-being has more moral value, and then you, whether that consequentialist in question, uh, sorry, whether that utilitarian question would say well the right the wrong thing is binary and the highest one is right and everything else is wrong or or there's like a, some scalar view it doesn't matter um that's both equally captured uh for the graph um and the reason why every normative theory couldn't be that c line is because um there are actions that well don't comport with ha the moral value that a given normative theory would ascribe to that line if uh, if they're non-consequentialist theories um, so, for example, a deontologist um, wouldn't actually place a rule violation, um, even that does generate some utility, as having high, higher moral value. Uh, it would it would be a negative moral value, and they would say. And the view on whether it's like wrong or how wrong it is that's just a separate question, right? So, a consequentialist would just say that actions have moral values in terms of their utility. And the deontologist would say that action's moral value is is in terms of their rule comport, comporting or violating. Yeah. And a threshold yeah. deontologist is the difference between the two. So, and then whether you, and then what your view is on rightness or wrongness, that uh, and how you cash that out in terms of moral value, that's just a separate question. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's becoming clear to me now what you have in mind here. So, it, 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 yeah, that was my mistake, I guess, initially, because whenever I saw this moral value of a given action, I just wasn't sure if you were thinking about this as like degrees of wrongness and rightness or like better or worseness. But you're certainly right that like, you know, how consequentialists and how threshold deontologists and how absolutists or, you know, whatever kind of deontologists, how they conceive of moral value and not just rightness or wrongness, but how they talk about, you know, what makes an action better or worse. Like they're going to disagree on that question. And I guess what, what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is like this graph is a way of capturing those differences. 
Well, this graph is a way of capturing the differences that different normative theories would ascribe moral value to a given action. Yeah, right? that's yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. So, so are, are you comfortable are. with using the language of better and worse here with the moral value? Uh, yeah, that's fine. You can say as long as it's as long as it's clear that the question of rightness and wrongness is a separate thing, right? So, so I under because I understand some people can say like the most right, um, sorry, the most better, the most the best action is the right action, and all other actions on that spectrum are all just wrong actions, yeah. right? And there are other people that can say that, well, actually. If it's good, if it's good enough, um, then it's still right, but maybe not as right. So that's the, so I the well, graph I, is not meant to deal I, with that question. That's the yeah. The the idea is just if if there's two layers of like moral analysis, and the first layer is like, is it better or worse, and then the second the second layer is is it right or wrong. Um, I, that second layer we just don't even really need to like talk about that right now i think is basically what you're saying mm -hmm. avi like we can just we can just talk about that first layer yeah because the graph is just meant to describe how different nor normative theories uh, cash out the first layer that's all it is yeah because if yeah we, if i we think have, like if we end up with these questions after like okay on tv this action is better and this action is like way better which is right it's like well that that's that's like a, a separate question I, I wouldn't i was gonna say second order but it's not it's not like a meta -ethical question or something it's just um it's it's like um it's like a step removed from what we need to talk about to make sense of the graph it's like a kind of further question yeah, I think I think that's right. I think maybe initially I was overcomplicating things a bit and how I was thinking about it. But I think the more I'm looking at it, the more I'm thinking about it, it I think it, it, it does seem to make sense. Well, I mean, if you realize that we're crazy after, please feel free to you know contact us again. and, and Yeah, you guys we're... are just way off. <laughs> way off. It'd be nice. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. no, that's good. Okay, so so yeah, we've got we've got the general idea across here um obviously i mean we have a, a whole series of like questions i don't know if we'll get into all of them but um avi do you have a particular place you want to go now did you want to say more about the graph or you want to just start asking some of these things we have here i think we have clarity on the on the graph if everyone agrees and i think i think we can agree that this is like in terms of how these three at least how their structured normative theories classify moral value for a given action i think the graph does a pretty good job at describing that, which is the purpose of the graph, to describe how these three normative theories um, ascribe moral value to given actions. Hey, can I can okay. I say one other thing about T? Sure. So do, do you think T can vary? I don't know if you said that it could. Do you think that T can move around? How do you mean oh, that? Oh, it, 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 you, it, it, you mean shifting T up or down? Is that what you mean with the same slope? I mean, depending, I, I guess my thought is that depending on the constraint or the duty or right, however you want to talk, Depending on the deontological constraint in question, that line might move around. Oh right? yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah sense, absolutely. Sense. See, By definition, it will. Yeah, the idea is like, see how the gap between the C and D line is the same size as the gap between the um, x-axis and the D line. Yeah. Say that you had an action that was deontically wrong to a far greater degree, like you know, exploding a planet or something. Uh, let's say that that's that's like really wrong on some deontological theory. Um, then you're talking about a way lower D line. Everything comes out the same, except the gap between the horizontal line and the D line is way larger. And, you know, consequently, no pun intended, the uh, gap between the C line and the T line ends up being equivalently larger. Same if yeah. you have a deontic wrong that's less wrong, right? It's going to all get smaller. Good. Yeah, I should say that, yeah, does, I, that does sneak in uh, uh, one assumption. So um, I think I think it's in the Stanford Encyclopedia. Are you guys familiar with the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy? Oh, yeah. Um, so I yeah. think I think Larry Alexander and Michael Moore, I believe they wrote the entry on deontological ethics. And one thing that they point out is that there's actually two different versions of threshold deontology. Like you might have a version, uh, you might have what I would think is a really implausible version that set that locates uh, the threshold for every deontological constraint, like at the same place, like the same amount of oh, consequences yeah. go. For oh God, threshold. yeah. Ooh. Yeah, so that's the simple version, I think they call it, versus this sliding scale, uh, I think that's the term yes. I use, this sliding scale version of deontology. And that would be the sense in which the T might move around, right, in this ladder kind of case. Yes, right, right. The way right, to think right. about that, Ty, is 
Yeah, the way the way to think about that, Ty, is if you if let's just imagine you slid the D line up or down, right? Then what would happen to the T line is the T line would slide up or down accordingly to the same degree. And consequently, the intersection of the T line and the X axis would move, which is the threshold, would move left or right. So like if you take yeah. if you take a deontic wrong that's a lot less wrong, let's say that there's some model where like flicking someone is wrong to like a very small degree. Um, you're gonna again whole thing's gonna look the same except D line is gonna be higher and therefore T line is gonna be higher to the same degree. But if you raise the T line up, what's gonna happen to the intersection point? of the T line and the X axis, AKA the threshold where on threshold deontology, the action moves from wrong to right. Well, it's going to move leftwards, right? It's going to yep. be, the threshold will go down. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and C, C never moves, right? Yeah. We, we take it. C is just constant. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. I think, Although yeah. There's, right, now, I know, I, I'm sorry, I'm before we get this, cause I know, I know. Yeah. Words, yeah I you know, it's I constant. Know we're, we're gonna go oh, ahead, the gonna mathematicians just got triggered at you, Isaac. Right. I, yeah. So there's people who are going to want to say you could have some kind of utilitarianism that's not linear. Like it could be, um, you know, maybe it's like exponential or has some weird shape to it. And say say for whatever reason that makes sense and you you have a view like that um i i think everything's still gonna apply it's just you're gonna get um you like everything just said will apply except there'll be a different um the t line will also take on that kind of weird shape but it'll still be offset to the same degree by the d line and vertical or horizontal movement of the d line will still result in um sorry, up or down movement of the D-line will still result in left or right movement of the threshold, regardless of if you have a like a linear or non-linear kind of yeah. utilitarianism. Okay. okay, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Okay, so after, after staring at this for a while, I think, I think I've got it. I think, I think it looks good. Um, I might have some lingering questions, some things I think about later on, but for, for now, I think I'm, I'm pretty good on it. Yeah, I mean, it might, it might take some, some mulling over. I mean, you know more about this than either of us by a long shot, surely, but also new information, especially if you have a bunch of thoughts on a topic, you got to synthesize it and, and let it all gel and kind of see. So, so yeah, I get what you're saying. You're, you're like comfortable enough, but you still need to kind of like think on it a bit to like fully know if you agree yeah sure yeah okay, okay. all right cool we that's, can move on to the questions yeah that's definitely enough that we can continue on talking for sure okay and so the first uh question uh that we are to discuss is what differentiates threshold deontology from rule utilitarianism and the reason this question is being asked is because now um, <laughs> I, I think it's very is, I, I just have to say, like, Ty, this has been, like, uh, just the bane of our existence. This, what I take to be, like, really frustrating question. But, yeah, sorry. Isn't, guys, this, go, go isn't this a very simple question, though? It, it's, it, it's, it should it's, be. It see, really I, should be. I, I almost said right there this stupid question. But I didn't, I didn't want to <laughs> seem trivializing of, of something that you, like, work a lot on. But... Yeah, like it's it is such a silly question, and we've had like we've had to do debates on this. We have one popular streamer who's like spread a lot of garbage on this topic, and I, apparently is still doing so. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, well, to be, to be clear, I haven't worked a lot on the question of what distinguishes from threshold ontology or what distinguishes moderate or threshold ontology from rule consequentialism. But that's just because I mean I think you know it's just they're different kinds of theories. They they have different justifications for what they're, you know for the action guidance and, and you know what they posit as uh, you know the understanding for you know why the rules are important or the constraints or however you want to talk. Yeah, I mean I I take it to be that what well here's one simple differentiator. Um, one simple difference between a threshold deontologist and rule utilitarian is that a threshold deontologist can invoke rules that generally decrease utility whereas a rule utilitarian by definition can't i mean so i i, I like yeah, to, yeah. i think there's a really formal way to do it too like if two systems being true results in a logical contradiction they're not identical threshold deontology and rule utilitarianism both being true results in a contradiction therefore they're not identical that's just modus ponens and then the second premise there about the two of them being true resulting in a contradiction you could find like specific instances where that's true or you could do something general and you could say like 
um, if TD is true, it's possible for utility maximizing, sorry, for a, yeah, maximizing, sure. Yeah, I, I can say it. Well, uh, you don't like the word maximizing. You think of that a little differently than me. So I'm going to use your word. What did you like? Not amp uh, supporting or, or utility conducive or whatever. Oh, me? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah you, just promoting, utility promoting. Because, I mean, right. usually when people talk about maximizing, they're saying, like, that's the thing that does the most. Right. Like, out of all the available action options. Right. Yeah. So so I, I just, as I was talking, I remembered we used different language there. So it's caught me up. But, yeah, okay. So you can say... Um, to, to support that second premise there that you get a contradiction if they're both true you can just say okay well if threshold deontology is true it's possible for there to be an action that is utility promoting and morally wrong if real utilitarianism is true then that's not the case you just get p and not p they contradict and then from that prior argument just modus ponens your way to they're not the same Wait, say that one more time. On rule utilitarianism, you can't get an action that's utility utility promoting. Uh, yeah, so and... you 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 can't have some. So on rule utilitarianism, say you have a rule that's um, that's utility promoting. That can't be morally negative. That can't be a bad thing on rule utilitarianism. On threshold deontology, even even a utility promoting rule can be negative. Right, so the proposition, this rule can be negative, is true on one system and false on the other. So you get a contradiction if they're both true. Yeah, right. But you, so are you're thinking that like, look, a rule that a rule consequentialist selects, they select it because like, so people talk about this differently, but one way people talk about it is like, look, if you follow this rule and these other rules, like that'll lead to the most utility in the long run, right? Like that'll you know have the best consequences in the long run. Um, but it's still going to be the case that, like, sometimes following a rule will not have as good consequences as not following the rule. And the rule consequentialist is still going to say that it's the right thing to do to follow the rule because, like, not following the rules uh, generally, like, will have worse consequences. Like, they say things that, like, if you make exceptions for the rules just because you think it would be better not to follow the rule, like, that would – it would be worse for people to act in that way than to follow the rules generally. Yeah, well, I think that that's a slightly different – so th this is – Unless I'm misunderstanding you, you're almost talking about the difference between um, utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism and, and how someone tries to justify um, having those rules as a utilitarian. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted I wanted to make sure that I was clear on what you were saying, because I guess I well, was thinking that like a rule consequentialist could say that in a given case, following a rule d doesn't maximize utility, but it's still the right thing to do because we've chosen these rules on the basis of consequentialist considerations and generally following them would have the best results in the long run, yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, and, and, and whereas a, a, a moderator, a threshold deontologist could say, look, let's all follow these rules and we can already see that it's not going to result in the best society, that there's going to be maybe some pain and suffering along the way, right. and that maybe it would be better not to follow these rules consequentially. Right. But it's intrinsically wrong to violate these rules. It has no, you know, the, the, the effects have nothing to do with it. So follow the rules anyway. Yes, right. So yes, yes. You, 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 ex you gave more, like, like color to it. Like you, you, made, you made it more clear what's being said. But like the fundamental pattern there is still the same, right? The, like let's just step by step through because i think you'll agree with every step like if two systems being true results in a logical contradiction they're not the same system surely that's not controversial we all agree about sure. that okay and then the second step if if i get that second premise to go through that the two of them uh ru and td being true results in a contradiction then we also agree we can just modus ponens our way to the conclusion that they aren't the same system we, we agree on that seems good Right, so then it's all the weight is just on that second premise. And then the idea is, I think that you could find the contradiction in different ways. So I think that you can find specific cases. And then with a specific case, you can go, oh, like on TD, you ought to do X. And, or sorry, on RU, you ought to do X. And on TD, it's not the case that you ought to do X. So you can do that for some specific action or another way to show the contradiction. And this is preferable to me, um, just because it's a bit easier is just to talk in general, right? You don't even have to talk about a specific situation. You can just talk kind of, I guess, like maybe like modally, but you can just talk about like what's possible on the two systems, right? And that was, that was the approach I took to showing the contradiction. And it's possible on TD to have an action or a rule that's utility promoting yet morally wrong. And on RU, that proposition is false. It's not possible to have a rule that's utility promoting and wrong. That's a logical contradiction. 
Got it. That, I think that makes sense. Um, so I think I might have communicated this over email already. Um, it, it might also seem obvious because it does seem kind of obvious to me. But I just I think that like when I've talked to people before about because, I mean, this is a natural question. People might think that, oh, rural utilitarianism says follow the rules unless, you know, disaster, then, you know, break the rule. And you might think that does sound a lot like, you know, modern or threshold ontology. Like, I don't I don't think that sounds so different on the face of it. Right. Like, oh, follow the you know the deontological rule unless you need to prevent a catastrophe like you might think you know those those do sound very similar at least right mm -hmm. but and, and and what i think what what to sort of try to diagnose some of the confusion and i'm not i'm not sure if this is exactly what's going on but i mean you can get a threshold deontological theory and a rule consequentialist theory that prescribe all the same actions like if if a rule consequentialist theory has a, like a prevent disaster rule and the degree of seriousness that needs to be at stake or whatever in order to break a rule is the same amount of the degree of seriousness that a threshold deontologist says, like, you know, when they're locating the threshold in order to permissibly violate a constraint. Like, if they take the degree of seriousness for violating the rules to be the same for, like, every, you know, rule, then, you know, you're going to get equivalent action guidance, right? They're going to be extensionally equivalent in the sense that they're going to tell agents to do all the same things. But nevertheless, even in a case like that, the theories are still distinct, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're just giving different justifications for those very rules. And I think, you know, again, that seems obvious, but I think it, it seems to me that that, that does confuse people sometimes. It, it's, it's confused many people. Um, I think that, yeah, we've, we've dealt with that confusion. Um, because people people go well if they prescribe the same things then they're the same system and they prescribe the same things therefore they're the same system um and there's there's like two layers of like where that can be objected to right i guess obviously because there's two premises but you know you could object to that second premise and, and try to have this kind of more i guess is empirical the right word i, I don't know but it feels a bit more empirical you could have, you can kind of get into this empirical battle about which kind of things are are utility promoting and therefore like which cut which kind of things are um you know prescribed on the two theories and you basically you can argue about is it really the case that they prescribe the same things but on the other hand you can say um you can you can fight against the first premise um which is effectively what i took you to be doing there which is just to say well it doesn't follow from the fact that two theories have or make all the same prescriptions that they're the same theory and if we if we show that's a problem, then even if the second premise goes through and TD and RU make all the same prescriptions, we can't just straightforwardly get from there to them being the same theory. And that's setting aside yeah. other defeaters. We have like the fact that there's contradiction between the two theories. Yeah, that's right. So then the point just seems to be that like equivalent action guidance doesn't entail like equivalent theories like it's, right. they're just they're giving different justifications. I mean, the one way I put it sometimes uh, when I'm talking to people about this is that, like, look, the threshold deontologist thinks that, like, violating one of the constraints, violating the constraint against lying or the constraint against torture or whatever, there's something about that action in itself that makes it wrong. There's this, that action is just inherently wrong. It has some degree of intrinsic is a word, you know, these philosophers use sometimes. There's just something about that action type itself that makes it have a certain degree of, of, of badness to it, right? And then the rule consequentialist just doesn't talk like that. They say, yeah, torture is bad, right? Uh, lying is bad, but not because there's anything just intrinsically bad about lying or torture. It's not like there's something just in the nature of those actions themselves uh, that makes them wrong. It's just that like, hey, if people go around lying and torturing, it's going to lead to a bad society or it's going to lead to a worse society than if people didn't go around lying and torturing. So when you when I, I think when I put things that way, it seems, at least to me, it seems very evident that these are very two very different justifications for the rules. And so, you know, by consequence, it's like they're two they're just two different theories or two different ways of understanding what you know why you know we ought to follow the rules yeah i mean i i agree completely with all that we have a different bent i guess on how we like to describe it i i have a i have a love for logic so if i see a way to just straightforwardly frame something as a contradiction formally like i'm just gonna latch on to that um but i mean i i agree, yeah i got gotcha. you i, that I makes agree sense. completely with what you're saying though and it seems obvious yeah and um uh oh yeah and i was just gonna give a further kind of intuition pump here like if you know say like i go to the ice cream store and get vanilla ice cream and you know ty goes to the ice cream store and gets vanilla ice cream 
like it's, it's just so obvious that it doesn't follow from us doing the same thing that we have the same like motivating concern or something like that now you might distinguish between a motivating concern and normative value. so what whatever but the the analogy is the same kind of thing okay like maybe i'm buying ice cream because i i intend to like torment my enemies with it i have them like jailed in my basement i'm gonna go eat it in front of them or something and you know ty gets it to like you know i don't know like like give a present to like a family member right it's like we we have we have the same action but it's like the underlying like theory about what we want to do or what we ought to do or something that's like has led us to that action or has ha, that prescribes that action it's like completely different it just seems obvious that they can be completely divorced yet you know prescribe the same thing right so let me say let me just say one other thing about this because like i think that naturally at this point a lot of people just react with oh then what's even what's even the practical significance of this debate like who cares like if they if they both say right. they you know could prescribe all the same actions like who cares which one gives the right to, justification to, to, just to be clear and, i don't grant that i don't grant they prescribe all the same things but, but yeah things. neither yeah, do but, i but yeah but i think one thing i think i i think i can't remember our email conversation exactly but i think that one thing or an idea i flirted with over email and i think it might be right is that no there still is some practical significance to this debate like even if we stipulate again even if we stipulate that the two different theories prescribe all the same actions they give all the same action guidance to agents you might think so if you so have you guys heard of the distinction between so this is a distinction Kant makes between morally worthy actions and actions that are merely in conformity with duty have you heard of this distinction before i don't think so i have not Okay, so this is this is really interesting. I like I think Kant's right about, or at least there's some there's some kernel of truth I think in, in in what he's saying here. So basically, the idea is like when someone does the right thing for the right reasons, you know, they deserve to be praised for that action, right? It's like, hey, good job, you did the right thing, and you were motivated by the thought that like, hey, this is the right thing to do, like this is the thing I should do, this is a good thing to do. So bam, you got a morally worthy action. And what he do, what he says is like that's those are actions that are done from duty or from the motive of duty. And then on the other hand, you have actions that are motivated by like non moral or non you know uh, morally worthy type considerations. Like suppose so the the example Kant uses I think is like the shopkeeper. He says a shopkeeper who doesn't like uh, you know um, what does he say? He's like a shopkeeper who doesn't like inflate their prices or something. How does he put it? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to remember the example now. But I, I mean, I could put it however no, I want. So the time. idea is like the shopkeeper who doesn't, you know, inflate their prices because they think that like they shouldn't, you know, mistreat their customers. Like that's better than a shopkeeper who doesn't inflate their prices because they don't want word to get out and they don't want to get a bad reputation. Like the person who doesn't inflate their, you know, prices or whatever because they, you know, you know, they're motivated by this like moral motive, like not to mistreat people. It seems like they deserve praise in a sense in which the other person with a selfish motive doesn't seem deserve to deserve praise. It seems like one of them is more praiseworthy than the other, or like maybe the other one isn't praiseworthy at all. So and I think this is pretty intuitive, right? It does seem like when someone does something, like if someone pushes a button and intends to save a million people, like, hey, good, they intended to save a million people and like, good for them, they're to be praised. But if someone presses a, a button and they think it's gonna kill a million people and they wanna kill a million people, but they accidentally save a million people, like, no, they're not to be praised. Like, you guys agree with that, right? Yeah, of course. You're like, okay, so, okay, so I know this is kind Sorry, of obvious, yeah, but I think... it took me a sec to think about that. that yeah, obviously, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I do think this is totally obvious, right? But I think it's important to maybe bring this up in this discussion because you might think, you might think that someone who doesn't lie to you or doesn't torture you, and the motivation is that, oh, if I lie or torture to you, like, man, that that's like a world in which people are lying and torturing would lead to, like, a worse society, and like that's maybe why I shouldn't lie to you or torture you. You might argue that that person has a kind of like faulty or like not so great motivation versus someone who says, "Hey, I'm not going to lie to you and I'm not going to torture you just because like that's wrong in itself. Like that's something that's really bad. That's just like you know it's just the wrong thing to do independently of you know the consequences, unless the consequences are like really severe, right? So you can see that there when you bring out like the different justifications and you see how they might motivate people in different ways, you might think, I mean, if you're someone who's attracted to moderate deontology or threshold deontology, you might think that someone who is a rule consequentialist, but is only ever motivated to follow the rules by the thought that they want a good society in the long run, you might think that that's not such a great motivation for them to not torture people or not lie to people, right? You might think that like, that's not, you know, that's not a person that deserves to be praised. Whereas you might think 
that someone who goes around and not torturing and not lying because they just think those actions are intrinsic or wrong. Like, that's just not how you treat people. Like, that person, you may think you may think that that person is actually getting the facts right, and they deserve to be praised. Like, they really got it. You know, they've really got, you know, the right attitude toward these things. Do you see how – so then do you see yeah. how there might be some practical significance here, even if the actions that the two theories prescribe are the exact same? I see what you're saying. So you're saying – so. The, you could have different normative theories that can judge the value, the moral value of given actions. However, we typically uh, want to judge people. If we're not judging actions, we're judging people as praiseworthy or not praiseworthy on the basis of their intent to conform with that normative theory. So, for yeah. example, yeah. yeah. And so if the normative theories prescribe the same actions, but for different reasons, then we would still praise or not praise people differently depending on where we're coming from there. Yeah, and I think, and again, again, I think that's a very important part of the social practice of morality. I mean, to really make this vivid, suppose there were a theory that was just interested in maximizing insta- instances of the color purple in the world. They're like, man, I just want to maximize a lot of purple. I just want to see purple everywhere. If it actually turned out for whatever reason, by some miracle, if it turned out that that theory in the end prescribed all the same actions as threshold deontology did, you wouldn't think that the person going around trying to maximize purple and doing all the same things as a threshold deontologist is motivated to do. You wouldn't think that that person is like to be praised. Like they're just trying to maximize the amount of color purple in the world, right? Like that doesn't seem how people, like that doesn't seem like how we want people to be, like what a morally good person looks like or a virtuous person looks like. Sure. So you're saying sure, that yeah. there what at least one kind of uh, element of this discussion that's like practically significant is that the motivations behind someone's action um, plays into whether we assess them to be praiseworthy or not. And that, yeah, and I, again, yeah. I think it, that's morally salient. I think that's very important. I think that's an important part of our, our pra- like praising and blaming people is something we do all the time, and we, we think that people's motivations are you know ethically salient. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with that. Um, yeah, sorry, Avi, did you have anything on that also? Yeah, I, no, yeah, no, I completely agree. The point is that even if the actions prescribed are all the same, um, the intent will be different. And so it would actually matter on which, which normative theory you're ascribing to, not in terms of what actions you prescribe, but in terms of how you will judge individuals performing those actions, if you yeah, had so, access yeah, to their yeah. account. Yeah, it seems to me that this is this has been vastly under uh, underappreciated. I mean, I don't know. Actually, I don't know myself if anyone has talked about this in the literature. I mean, the, the distinction between morally praiseworthy, you know, motives and, and not morally praiseworthy motives, like that's been talked about. You know, that goes by the con. But with, you know, in this context of threshold ontology versus rule consequentialism, I don't know that that's been brought out. And it seems to me that it's, it's, it's at least relevant. Um, because it's a sense in which it, this debate does have some practical significance. It's not just about the actions that they prescribe. It's also about, you know, like what kind of, you know, people we want there to be and like what we want them to be motivated by. Now, of course, the consequentialist is going to say, forget about all that. None of it matters. As long as, as who cares about people's motivations, as long as everybody is, you know, leading to a better society, it doesn't matter what people's motivations are. But that's a very consequentialist thought. Like non-consequentialists aren't typically typically going to like that. They're going to think that, you know, uh, your character and motivation is important. Uh, you know, again, this goes back to Kant. Yeah, yeah, okay, so there is another, um, there's another, oh, oh, well, okay, one thing to say is that this is all, um, in a sense, like, I I guess I shouldn't say beside the point, but, like, since when is having a clear practical purpose, um, you know, a condition for what kind of, you know, philosophical or, like, scientific thinking we want to engage in like i understand maybe you could make some kind of case about like resource allocation like we wouldn't want to put all of our like money into science that's not you know gonna pan out in some like kind of practical advance for civilization or something like this maybe you could say something similar about philosophy but like i mean even if even if there weren't practical significance like you know since when is that like a barrier to exploring interesting things so that's one point and then uh just another kind of I mean, I guess practical significance, it probably, the, whether what I'm about to point out is practically significant probably depends on what you mean by practically significant. But, you know, another another thing is that a lot of people who adopt RU actually, once pressured, start contradicting themselves. Um, 
Now, that's that's not obviously true of all people who adopt rule utilitarianism. There's people who, you know, once you face them with cases like, um, not to be too graphic, but like, you know, like raping someone when it has no effect on utility or something like that. So, you know, some of these people will just say, yeah, it's fine. But a huge amount of people start struggling once you start bringing up situations like that, right? So it seems like there's some, at least from my experience, some substantial amount of people who will identify as really utilitarians, but when you show what their theory actually entails, will start becoming queasy. Um, and TD is basically, you know, it's, it's, it's more than this, but it's like an escape hatch from that, right? Because it's like you can you can have these same kind of considerations without having to bite the bullet on sort of right. what seem like the insane entailments of like rule utilitarianism. So one element of practical significance is, you know, or maybe practical significance is for people who want to have a normative theory to be able to do so without contradicting themselves for all the people who that again, for, for those people who do contradict themselves when they try to defend are you for those kind of reasons. Is that, is that clear? Or is that a bit of a, that turned into a ramble there? Uh, no, I think that's clear. I mean, I have a couple of things I could say. I mean, what, so you mentioned like who really cares about practical significance. I mean, I study philosophy. Of course, I don't care about whether the theories, <laughs> you know, different theories. Are pra- I mean, I just think they're intrinsically interesting, right? Like I want to understand, you know, sure. different things. I don't care about literally, you know, I don't care about all the, uh, whether it has literally like any practical implications. But anyway, that's, you know, that's one thought. I just think yeah. these theories are intrinsically interesting to think about. But yeah, I, I should say like one thing that, I mean, this has happened to me. Like I... Like I said to to you guys earlier, I'm not sure if this was part of the recording or if this was earlier. Um, one thing that that moved me to threshold ontology at the time, a few years ago, when I was attracted to the theory, was that I wanted, you know, I was attracted to utilitarianism, but then I didn't, you know, I demanding this seemed really bad to me, and you know, sacrificing people in certain situations, like that moved me to rule utilitarianism. And I was like, okay, good, now I can have a set of rules that you know. Uh, prohibit torture and things like that unless the the consequences are severe but then i mean like you said like eventually just is the thought just occurred to me that just like i don't think that torture is wrong just because like you know it would lead to a better society if i didn't do it like i just think that it's a wrong justification it's like torture is wrong because it's just wrong it's just like that's not how you treat people it's just a it's just bad in itself like that's just not how people are to be treated independently of any considerations about the consequences so like that yeah definitely that's what pushed me to the more deontological side of things. But of course I didn't right. go full on absolutist because I was like, no, there's gotta be there's gotta be certain cases where yeah. enough is at stake. You know, there's gotta be uh, certain cases in which there's enough good or enough bad to be prevented that, you know, it would it would justify violating constraints. So yeah, I think right. I got this I definitely got pushed around in these different directions. Yeah, I think also people can get to that point of of seeing there's like a problem with rule utilitarianism. Again, I should be clear here. Like, I'm, I'm like not a realist about morality. When I say a problem, all I'm really talking about is a, is a failure to map preferences well. But, but you, if you take a problem to be something more robust, that's fine also. But um, people get to seeing the problem with RU uh, by different means. Like, it sounds like you just got it by by just thinking about like what the right reason is to want to do something. I, I kind of got there by noticing actual like reductios on the view, like. If I actually think this is what makes for goodness, then it was really like the vacuum situations that's, that started messing with me, so which, uh, by which I mean situations where utility is just neutral, but you're doing something that seems like still very problematic. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the reductios are also another way to get there. Because I, I guess you could you could just sit there and just, just think and go, I don't know if like this is a noble reason to not want to torture someone. Or you could be like, more like the kind of thinking I did, you could be like, hmm, well, if if I think not torturing someone is wrong for this reason, then if that reason's removed, it's okay to torture someone. Wait, what? <laughs> that that seems bad. <laughs> right. Then, yeah, so there's yeah, different ways I to get there, it, yeah. Yeah, I think another way of putting this is just, I mean, really another way of putting the same point is that just, you know, just ask someone to picture two possible worlds, like one in which everybody's like raping each other and doing all these like really bad things, and welfare is neutral 
Uh, but then imagine a world in which like everybody's friends and treating each other fairly and being honest and doing all these other nice looking things. Like imagine the welfare levels are the same in the two worlds. Like right. a lot of people are going to prefer the world without the rape. Yeah, that, <laughs> that that's so, another good one. Create two. Yeah. Two situations with equally. Is it the same setup? Actually, whatever. We can we can puzzle over if it's the exact same kind of setup or not. But yeah, give it's two similar at least. Very, if not the same. Yeah, very similar. It's like give two worlds where utility is equal but there's just something else that we obviously prefer about one world over the other i guess that someone yeah. would try to say there's no moral difference and i just have a difference of preference um if if there's some kind of realist who has like a, a view like that but i mean yeah yeah that's just a way of trying to pump the intuition that there's something besides welfare that matters. It's right. not just yeah. welfare or well-being that matters. There's other. It's just a way of trying to sort of you know bring it out in people that there's other things that they care about besides just the level of like aggregate welfare in a world. Right. Level, you know, aggregate well-being. Yeah, I think so. And um, for for me as someone who doesn't make that kind of separation, like <clears throat> that move's not really available to me to go like this is the world that has the right morality. But or the morality is the same in the two worlds. I just prefer one over the other because I, I view that all as one kind of thing. I, I just take morality to be about preferences. So so, what with that not being an escape hatch, like that move works particularly well. I mean, I think that'll apply to a lot of people who are like not realists. But um, yeah, I'm a little. I have you, to. I have to confess. I'm I'm a little confused by your like overall stance. I'm not sure what to make of it. So like, do you think there are like ethical truths? Depends what you mean by an ethical truth. Of course. Um, sorry to give a bad right. answer. Like, how, how, I mean, I think that I, so what I, what I know is that I have preferences, um, for certain things. Like I have a preference <clears throat> to like eat some kind of food or I have a preference to like not kill someone. And <laughs> I, I understand whenever I talk to someone who's more realist leaning, the second I refer to two things that seem, you know, kind of like, it's kind of different in their importance like not killing someone versus eating my cereal is like both just preferences they think well s something seems weird about that but that i'm kind of stuck there because i just don't really i don't understand what it is that like separates these kind of what seem like my like moral feelings from the other ones i have it just seems like i prefer for certain things not to happen so if there's something more robust going on there like I'm open to being shown it, but I'm, I'm just not sure. So if, if you want to talk about cognitivism, like whether these statements have truth value, it depends on what we take a moral statement to be. Like if a moral statement is like predicating some kind of like funky, like property of the action, like for, for lack of I like that word, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that's, I gonna... like that way of talking. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well that, that's the, that way of talking will for me, uh, probably i'll probably start getting confused and not know what's meant there but but you know that that doesn't make me a realist by def you know necessarily though i mean you, you understand that right it depends what we mean by f funky property but maybe like so i mean yeah. i mean you might you might think so have are you familiar with uh moral error theory mm -hmm. yep so yeah so error theorists are cognitivists oh and okay think, yeah of course yeah they right. just think all moral utterances are false because moral utter like moral Sorry, thought I and been, talk yeah i, I should yeah, i should have been more clear yeah Right. So they think that moral thought and talk, ordinary moral thought and talk just presupposes the existence of these like, you know, mysterious normative properties that are out there. But guess what? Ain't nothing like that. Ain't, there ain't nothing out there like that. So, you know, then all these you know moral utterances are false. So they do have truth values are just all false. Right. Of um, course, you can think morality is about that kind of funky property predication, but just think all those statements are false and you're an error theorist. Right. So, good. yeah, I don't I don't think I'm I don't think I'm saying anything that should raise a problem for error theory here like all, all i'm saying is it depends on what we mean by um like because your question was about cognitivism right and error theory is a cognitivist view but it's like do i think moral propositions are truth apt and it just it depends on what we mean like if we're if we're talking about predicating like a funky property like i'm definitely not convinced that those are true um and i'm not even i'm not even clear if they're truth apt because if I'm not clear what's even being said, um, then I don't I don't actually know if it's the kind of thing that has a truth value or not. Um, yeah, you might think it's nonsense. Which yeah, exactly. Which wouldn't commit me all the way over to something like um, non cognitivism, where I'm just saying you know the, they're not truth apt. I might just become agnostic about their truth aptness, given that there's like a word that or or some kind of category of words that show up 
in moral propositions that just don't have any clear meaning to me. I might just become agnostic about their truth value. But the one other thing I'll say is, now, now people hate when I say this is like what a moral statement, what I mean by a moral statement, because it feels very like deflating. But if moral statements are, you know, in some way or another, without getting super committed to like one kind of like anti-realist, you know, meta ethic or something, if, if they're in some way or another, um, just kind of making statements about our psychology, like my psychology is such that I um, have a preference for so and so, right? Like those, those are just going to be descriptive kind of statements. I'm not, I'm obviously not going to have any problem with those being true. So, so hopefully that's enough to answer your question. It depends on what's yeah. meant by a moral statement. And those are like the kind of answers I'd give based on different rules. Sure. Then just a final thought, I guess, like you would, people would, um, a, a natural reaction people might have is like, you're talking about something else. Like if that's mm -hmm. your, if that's your conception of ethical statements and like what ethics is like, then you're not actually talking about ethics. Like you're mm -hmm. like, you know, ordinary moral thought and talk just isn't like that. It, you know, uh, this is kind of an error theorist type thought. Error theorists think that like, whenever we're talking about ethics, we're talking about demands that apply to everyone and they're not just contingent on individual preferences and things like that. So if you're talking about that, then you must be talking about something else. At least that's what, that's one line of response that I think probably someone might give to, to someone like you. I'm not sure how plausible it is. Well, but yeah. I, I also, I want to make it clear that I'm not offering any kind of theory about public moral language. Um, I know that I've, I've confused people by not being clear that that's not what I'm doing before. So to me, that's like an empirical, it seems obvious it's an empirical question. Um, what people are doing when they're making moral statements like are they stating beliefs they have um are they just you know expressing like non-cognitive mental states like like that that to me is is looking like an empirical question that maybe maybe psychology or like neurobiology or something will you know have some useful information for us there and i'm just agnostic about that or, or maybe maybe it's even like partitioned up like some amount of our statements are kind of like error theoretic we're making reference to these like non-existent properties like some of our statements are kind of non-cognitive like maybe maybe it's a bit of a of a mishmash i don't know that's an open question but i'm just saying so so what i'm not doing is offering a theory of public moral language i'm open on that um what i'm doing is just offering a construal of like what a statement like that could mean that would like make sense to me or showing what issues I would have with certain other kinds of construals. Okay. And like, yeah, if I, mean, I person, sorry, just one last thing. If I personally make a statement about what's moral, all I'm saying is my preferences are, you know, such that they're like in support of or against this. Yeah. I guess, I, I guess one other thought is that like, I mean, it, it would be hard to make sense of moral criticism on that view. You might think like, do you morally criticize people for things that you take to be wrong? If by morally criticize, we just mean, have a preference against their preferences and verbalize yeah. that then yeah yeah so i mean when you like when you say hey no what you're doing is wrong i don't you know don't do that like it, it, it's just it's hard to wrap my head around like what authority that could have for a person when if they realize that all you're saying is i, I prefer that you not do that and it doesn't any kind of have any kind of authority that i should be concerned with yeah i don't, I don't know that it would have authority in any any like meaningful sense i think that you know, there might there might be like some kind of like social concerns or there might be like interpersonal concerns or some something that's ultimately like psychological there that might lead to someone being motivated by um, me or others or the community like not um, uh, not sharing their preference or, or having a preference against it. But yeah, I don't think there's some like spooky like normative like force or some kind of thing that I get to like invoke when I make criticisms of someone's uh preferences or ethics if you want to say that interesting i i have like a million other things i could i could ask you about this but maybe <laughs> we should maybe we shouldn't um and it, just for the sake of of staying on td to get i think avi probably is he hasn't talked for a while he probably has a lot to ask maybe we'll do that but yeah I, we should continue sometime because i'm interested in that um i'm very open to seeing other views i i, I actually want to become like a really robust moral realist it's kind of like my goal but i just can't seem to find a way to get myself there but you know if someone can convince me i would i would like love to 
I would love to be able to tell everyone who's not vegan that they're like morally wrong and and have some, exactly like <laughs> it'd be nice yeah <laughs> yeah that's well that's what I was gonna say is like if you really want to engage in moral criticism that you see as like authoritative and people should pay attention to you then it you know it'd be easier to sort of you know that criticism would land easier if you thought that like they really were making some kind of mistake uh you know and not just a mistake by your lights but really they're making a mistake right well i think that i think that so there's actually an interesting separation maybe this connects back to that kind of stuff we were talking about earlier with parfit about the distinction between like or about how, how motivation and, and reasons connect and stuff like this but you know it's it's not clear that normative force if we grant that's like an idea that makes sense and moral statements could somehow have that it's not clear that m normative force somehow like translates into motivation right like maybe like maybe i could show something is morally right and someone just like wouldn't care like i i don't it's so i like i i guess maybe i'm sounding like i'm contradicting what i said earlier how do i sum this up i guess what i'm what i'm saying is it seems like when you have a moral discussion it's all about like you know it's you're talking about like probably persuasion and stuff like this and you're like interfacing with with someone else to try and bring them around to your view and i i'm not convinced that like the only way to do that is to c convince them there's like abstract like like weird like moral sure. properties out there and then those properties are like against your view. like that might even be confusing for a lot of people it might be easier to do stuff <laughs> like maybe a lot of the time you can do internal criticism without even getting into what the right um kind of meta ethic is and just show that they have they have a conflict or maybe you could yeah raise, yeah i was like, going to mention that a lot of people are attracted to the idea that like look if people could only see that like you know like a lot of people who like you know or don't care about eating animals or harming animals like they don't realize that they're actually being incoherent that if they really saw what their fundamental views about what matters like entails they would see that they're actually doing things that by their own lights they wouldn't approve of if they right. really could just realize no. what they really care about and how what's entailed by that now i don't i don't have a study or anything but I, I have had like hundreds of those conversations and i will tell you from from my experience that there are many people like that now i'm definitely not suggesting that um without i'm not i'm not saying that i think there's some way to persuade everyone i'm i i don't have any way to show that irreconcilable value differences um don't exist right maybe maybe they they do I, I kind of lean towards they probably do like you know there might just be some people who who can't be brought around to your point of view they just have different values there's no kind of yep. higher authority on what the right value yep. should be and there's there's just no persuading them and now this is sounding more in line with what i said earlier about the, the reasons and stuff but i i just i i'm just always quick to kind of kind of like when someone does the kind of uh, thing that you just said, which is point out there, there might be a problem about moral criticism if there's no like weight to your criticism. I just like to point out like, well, weight or like normative force or whatever you want to call it. That's like this thing that like philosophy people will be concerned about. But like, does that actually even play that big a role in like the conversation with the average person? And like, what kind of tools are still available to us? There's like internal criticism. There's yeah, it's like making them aware of like other facts that might lead them to to change their assessment. Right. Of, so there's still like tons of tools. So just it doesn't straightforwardly follow from like not being able to invoke some kind of normative force that you like can't persuade everyone. And it, it might actually yes. even be that it has barely any impact at all on persuasion. That's possible. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I think certainly one way of persuading someone is to show them that like uh, what they're doing is something that's like not reasonable by their own lights, like mm -hmm. because they have other commitments that show what they're doing. Like it does. There's some tension, you know, there's some tension in their views or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's certainly one way of doing it. But I guess I, I was sort of thinking that if, if, if all right, so I'm imagining I'm you. I'm like, hey, uh, I'm Isaac and I think that X is wrong. And hey, don't do X. And if the person is like, wait, Isaac, but, but why? Like, what? you know, what do you mean X is wrong? Like, why can I do X? And then you say, oh, well, I just prefer that you don't do that. Like that, I mean, that just seems like that wouldn't have very persuasive uh, or wouldn't be very compelling or the person shouldn't, you know, be particularly worried about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't approach a conversation like that, obviously. I'd, I'd probably, yeah, if, if they, I, yeah, and I, I wasn't suggesting you were like seriously saying that's that's how you think I would, but, you know, I'd, I'd probably, if I said something was wrong and then someone said, why should I consider it wrong? I'd respond by saying, well, 
maybe maybe it's not the case you should consider it wrong but let's just like explore a little bit here and see so like first of all you know do you value so and so right and then maybe if they do like say they value utility or something it's like well there's like an empirical reason to think utility is maximized by this thing so it seems like it's actually good on your view uh, right and you can you so you can you can get into like whole discussions there but yeah i would i wouldn't just try to persuade someone by pointing out i don't like it unless unless i thought they were the kind of person who just really cares about my opinion <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean yeah all i was trying to do there is just trying to really understand like because i mean you said i mean you gave that little bit and i mean i might be misunderstanding you a bit but you said that little bit about what you thought about what you you know what kind of statement you're making when you make an ethical judgment mm -hmm. and it just seemed to me that like if you try if you explain that to a person all of a sudden they're going to think that like, oh, well, like why well, care about what, you know, Isaac thinks is, uh, is wrong. It's like, why should that have any, why should that have any bearing on what I do? And then again, and, and I'll stop at this point, but like one other thought is that like, it just doesn't seem like ethical judgments about what's right and wrong or like, or like that. It doesn't seem like judge, like it seems to me anyway, that when you say that something is right or wrong and, and, and ethically so like you're saying like, this is something that people have a reason to do or they don't have a reason to do and it doesn't matter what anyone's preferences are on the matter it's just like this is something you just you just should or shouldn't do it seems that way to me anyway i know there are arguments that go against that sort of thought but well, it seems to me that's a natural thought to have about ethical judgments yeah uh, so the, the only thing i want to be clear and I, you, you can have the last word on it that's fine i don't i don't need to but um or, or we can even continue on it for a minute i i just want to be clear i wouldn't try to persuade someone who has a view like mine meta ethically um, by pointing out that I have a preference against what they're doing. I mean, I might, I might mention that in passing and then have a discussion, but I would never expect that to be motivating for that person. And um, sure. I, I also want to say if, if you want to say that moral properties um, or sorry, that moral, moral statements are such that we're saying there's a reason against the action irrespective of what the person's desires are that that's exactly where i would start saying i'm lost because you're talking about categorical or you know um talking about like external oh so you just you reasons. just reject categoricity you just don't like categoricity well it depends how exactly you talk about categoricity i'm uh, do we mean the same by categorical are we talking about the same thing as an external normative reason yeah, just like well, something that's a reason for everyone, uh, you know, no matter what their mm -hmm. contingent psychological attitudes are. Uh, yeah, no matter what their attitudes are, right, because there could be things that are reasons for everyone, but it's not that it's an external narrative reason. It could just be that we have psychology such that our, you know, we, on even on internalism, yeah. we all have the same reason to do, you know, alpha or whatever. So yeah, I, so and, as I long think, as we're and I think some people yeah. want to capture moral reasons like that. They think that everyone... Li everyone actually internally it turns out that everybody has has moral reasons uh, uh, i'm not sure how plausible that is but some people have thought that way well i'm not opposed to that i'm not opposed to everyone has reasons um in virtue of their psychology or even if if the empirical case could be made i don't have any kind of like like you, you know um a priori consideration against um everyone having the same reason right but but it doesn't follow from everyone having the same reason like maybe we have the same psychology so we're all motivated to do so and so um it doesn't follow from that that the reason is externally normative right it's just a universal internal reason yeah that's right yeah, yeah. so but but if you want to actually go the step further and say you no know, like this is something that's right or wrong like for for any individual no matter what their psychological um makeup is like that's when i lose you if so i don't know if you're doing that or not but if you're doing that then you're talking about external normative reasons and i don't understand what those are yeah i guess i mean one, one of the things about this like some it, like you might think sometimes people think that the categoricity like that's what the uh, normative th authority amounts to but that that you know we shouldn't think that because i can't some philosopher i think has pointed this out before but you might think that like reasons of etiquette you know, like, you know, re reasons, can, you know, just pertaining to what's polite and what's rude and just like these kind of etiquette type reasons. You might think those are categorical. They apply to or at least they apply to everyone within a given society. Um, uh, you might think that those reasons all apply to everyone. But that, you know, they're not authoritative. Like, what's so special about etiquette? It's just like this contingent thing that people engage in, you might think. And so, like, there's no authority there, although you might still have categoricity. Uh, you don't necessarily get a
can pull those things apart as well. Well, if, if categoricity and external normativity are the same thing, I actually don't think you have it there. Um, but here, why don't you have the last word on, on this kind of stuff? And Because I, I could, like, this is one of those topics I, like, really love and I'm confused by some stuff in this area. So I, I can, like, just careen off into a whole discussion on this really easily. So why don't you have the last word on that stuff? And then Avi can maybe take it back to him. <clears throat> sure. Take it back to some of his, or, or some of his questions, yeah. Sure. Well, let me say I'm also very confused about it. Like, I really love metaethics. It's very hard. It's very confusing, but it's also very fun. So I really enjoy talking about it. But I guess uh, the thought I was kind of just trying to get at at, at the last point there was that, like, um, you might there might be a normative system like etiquette uh, or any other normative system like aesthetics or I don't know if you think aesthetics is a normative system, but, you know, reasons to you know admire certain paintings and things like this. Some people talk in this way. But just the point is that for any given normative system, you might have a normative system that issues you know, reasons for everyone, or it tries, you might think it tries to issue categorical reasons, um, if, if we can talk this way. You might think there's a normative system like that, but that's not to say that those reasons in themselves are, like, authoritative or reasons that we should pay attention to. There might be, like, reasons that don't really have any, you know, particularly, like, strong weight to them, although there might still be reasons for everyone. They're just not very strong reasons uh, that individuals have. Some people think this way, so this is just just one way of just like separating categoricity and authority. And I'm not saying that you were conflating those things, but I just like wanted to point it out because sometimes people sure. sort of run these things together. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and I, as far as I can tell, I think I agree. So yeah, they, they're, they don't seem like the same thing. Um, Avi, do you want to take it back to some TD stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, so we were at, the, okay. So we were going over, um, why it's well, okay meaningful difference between threshold deontology and really totalitarianism and one thing we said is that okay so we, there's two things so one thing um that you said ty was that um even if they both prescribe the same actions it can still be meaningfully different in terms of how we evaluate people and then the other thing to talk about is do they actually all prescribe the same actions and my view on that is no I think TD and uh, really utilitarianism don't actually prescribe the same actions. It's, it's very easy, easy to come up with hypothetical examples where threshold deontology and really utilitarianism could prescribe different actions. So for example, um, if we uh, just stipulated that um, hypothetically people weren't, um, wouldn't be anxious if they had the chance of having their organs stolen, right? Because the usual defense of organ theft, even if it will increase utility, is that it would decrease utility on a societal level because people would be all anxious about having their organs stolen. But hypothetically, for whatever miracle, if it was the case that they wouldn't be anxious and have a decrease in utility, a rule utilitarian wouldn't have any real basis to make a rule against stealing organs uh, to, to kill one to save five or whatever. Um, but a threshold deontologist would. So we can easily come up with hypothetical examples where these normative theories give different answers. We, we agree with that so far? Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Um, damn, I thought I wanted to say something about this, something else about this. But I think, again, I think it's going to just depend on the theorist, right? It's like different theorists might just give different, you know, or, or, or attribute different amounts of like significance to different considerations. So like, you know, you might just get variety because of that. But then again, the theories might come you know they might be closer to each other because certain theorists who are rule consequentialists and certain theorists who are threshold ontologists they might you know give sort of similar amounts of normative weight to similar considerations and in that way they might get closer but you're certainly right that like you know there could be there's could definitely be like different theories that don't have that don't give the same uh action guidance yeah because i mean it seems like in this hypothetical example like for for instance um if we just stipulate that there's this general rule, uh, let's just say that there's this rule of like not stealing organs, right? Um, and then we say, if we, we say, we just stipulate in some hypothetical world that it turns out if we were to, whether we make this rule or not, doesn't actually have any downstream societal effects on utility. And it doesn't, it, and it would actually increase utility if the practice were done. I don't see any basis where a rule utilitarian would say that we ought invoke a rule to not steal organs because the whole purpose of invoking rules is that they generally, although maybe not in every case, improve utility. Um, yep. So 
But a, but a threshold deontologist certainly could invoke that rule because they can just say that the basis for the rule is that it has intrinsic value. To not right. So I guess I yeah I guess what I was trying to point out there was just like I mean imagine there's a threshold deontologist who sets like an extremely low. <laughs> Like, you know, threshold. Oh, around. I see what you're saying. Yeah, then you might get the same sort of- But result. even then, even then actually, because we could just like atomize it further down. Um, they would still have a different moral weighting. Um, so like, let's say a threshold deontologist like brings their threshold down way instead of five, it's four or four, it's three, you know, or, you know, even, even like even two people. Um, and let's just say that um, what will happen if we steal an organ is we won't save two people. We'll save one person and we'll save another person for like half the normal time they would live. So it could be like 1.5, right? As long as it, the, the, they'll still give different prescriptions because the rule utilitarian would still say we should do that. So long as it wouldn't have any downstream societal consequences by put, putting the rule in place. But so the the, the example was like you would save a life and a half. Was that it? Yeah, exactly. Because like a life and then saving another life for like half the time span, ha half the, the lifespan that it would normally live for. Right. Right. So could you imagine a threshold deontologist saying like, oh, the threshold for like taking one person's organs and like killing them is like if there's a life and a half at stake, that's that's severe enough consequences. I can imagine someone saying that. It yeah. Add yeah. For me, but. Yeah, but then, but then, but here's the problem that because then I can just go one step under that. I can say, well, what if it saves 1.25 lives, right? Then it's, then it would still be a difference in what they're saying because the rule utilitarian would say perform the action and the thresh and the threshold deontologist, even with a low threshold, would say, well, that's even lower. And I'm not going to say perform the action because of that, even though my threshold's lower. Gotcha. Yeah. So right, we so, can. So, yeah. uh... So we agree then, let me just make sure, we agree that, uh, that well, obviously, this seems obvious at least, that threshold deontologists can attribute different uh, amounts of normative significance to different, you know, kinds of constraints. And some are going to, you know, take them to be more serious than others. Some are going to be, you know, uh, more attracted to the idea that consequences are, are very important. Uh, and some are going to think they're, they're not so important that they got to, you know, really build up in severity to... Uh, you know, outweigh the significance of a constraint. But then the idea is like you might, and actually, I don't know, I don't know if you read my, uh, I know you read some of my stuff, but in my paper, uh, my published paper, Deontologists Can Be Moderate, I talk about just the oddness of the view of someone who says they're a deontologist, but gives such a low weight to a constraint that it could be like easily outweighed <laughs> by trivial consequences like that yeah. seems like someone who's not really a deontologist at the end of the day i mean if they I mean, yeah if for sure constraints and like are you really a deontologist do you really care about these things yeah so i i agree that their prescriptions might be far more in line with the utilitarian uh pr with utilitarian prescriptions the only thing i'm trying to point out is that even then there will still be some degree of non-overlap where there will be some amount of prescriptions that will differ between a threshold deontologist with a very low threshold versus a utilitarian. And so even then they wouldn't be the question. same theory. There would they would be some there would still be some small amount of difference in prescriptions there. I got gotcha. you. That that certainly seems possible, right? I mean, I think that that seems right. And cuz cuz the thing is no matter how low you set your threshold, I can always ask the question for something slightly below that low threshold. And you'll still get different answers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so, once you set so, the threshold to zero, you, then you're just straight up util, utilitarian. Exactly, exactly. So I guess I mean the reason I mean the reason I was talking about this earlier and like really you know stipulating that they're the two are the same in terms of action guidance is just really because I wanted to bring out the point that that could be what confuses people, but they shouldn't be thrown off by that because even if you did stipulate that, there are other things that distinguishes the theories besides just their action guidance. But I think you're right that like you know obviously in practice uh, or whatever my, or the most plausible versions of those theories might not actually give the same action guidance right okay and so the other thing i wanted uh to discuss this is oh, just a little I, bit of a thought experiment I, here well, can i say one um so we on, on that on, just before we move on from that so there's all sorry Avi, it's just there's also like so there's like layers to finding where the like non-convergence is right so I think the the easiest way to do it is just um, 
without even talking about a specific case, just talk generally and show the contradiction about what's possible on the two theories. I think the next easiest thing is to create hypothetical situations where the two theories give you different um, prescriptions. But then there's a further question of, can we think of any actual real world cases where they give different prescriptions? Like any, any like current kind of issues out there in the world. And I, I actually just haven't thought about that. Maybe, maybe so, maybe not. I don't know if anyone has any views on that, but I just wanted to touch that sort of third way to show a difference before we move on. I, I, I do think that there are um, non-hypothetical real world examples um, where, um, a threshold deontologist might be able to have a difference in prescriptions as really utilitarians. Um, one example would be abortion, actually. So if you look at all the empirical data on societal outcomes on abortions, um, abortion being legalized seems to have positive utility. It seems to decrease the rate of uh, murder uh, homicides. It seems to uh, decrease the amount of children being born in uh, households that can't afford them and all of those societal um, utility problems that come along with it. Um, and so I don't see any basis for a rule utilitarian to uh, say that abortion uh, ought be um, ought be illegal because the data seems to clearly support that it that it being legal improves utility. Um, but a threshold deontologist, I think they can. I think a threshold deontologist may may have some rule where they would may consider that a form of uh, a form of murder or something and they may be able to say well that's just they're invoking the rule even though it does decrease utility so i do think there are some real world examples and we don't have to go to hypotheticals to come up with different prescriptions of threshold deontologists or at least some of them in rule utilitarians which, which i don't know if anyone I, I should point out i ask this just purely as like a point of interest i think i i should emphasize that it doesn't matter the slightest bit on any level at all if all the examples we can come up with are hypothetical or even if we can't come up with a hypothetical example and we can just give the general form of a um, counter example or, or like show that there's some some like general contradiction drivable in terms of what's possible without even creating a hypothetical um nothing nothing hinges on that they still turn out being different systems if any of the above go through i just it's just a point of interest i was just curious and yeah abortion does seem like one to me um but yeah that's, i just want to point that out because i don't want people to get the impression that anything actually hinges on whether we can find the real world situation and then think that arguing against the abortion example is somehow going to like damage our case that td and ru are distinct because it won't at all Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if anyone can think of any other real world examples, but I certainly think that I, I provided at least one. Yeah, yeah that might. That, I'm not, I'm not, I'd have to think about that case more. I'm not sure, but uh, that might be right. But I guess uh, I just hadn't thought about this too much before because, again, I just it didn't seem to matter too much in my eyes uh, whether we could come up with with those examples. Because, again, the thought is just that, like, the theories just seem so obviously different to me. I didn't I didn't think that we needed to even, you know come up with that but i mean you know it's something we could do yeah we definitely don't it's just just a random point of interest okay sorry you know, go, go on avi okay and so the next thing to discuss is um is threshold here's another question we've got is threshold deontology simply an attempt to combine two fundamentally incompatible normative theories together now this is also another straightforward question but it's a very the reason we're bringing very simple questions is because there are people who somehow think that the that this may be an issue. It's that, well, threshold deontology, you're really just smashing two incompatible theories together and you're just getting some kind of contradictory um, result or something like that. Which we, we, um, should, we should be fair to Destiny, because when I talked to him, he admitted, like, sorry, I should say, Ty, you don't know this guy, but a, a lot of our, our you know arguments on this have been with him and his community who are like really, they seem quite confused about this. Uh, it should be pointed out though, Destiny. I think that was the contradiction he admitted he couldn't derive. Like he couldn't, he couldn't find any kind of contradiction on um, on TD, and he did admit that verbally when we spoke. So, just to be to be fair to his position there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe a thought that one has in this context. I've seen some uh, authors talk about this. Like one thought is that like when threshold deontologists are trying to figure out the degree of stringency of a given constraint 
Like, well, how are they going to go about doing that? Oh, well, maybe they're just going to look at consequentialist considerations. And so it turns out that like all these, all these different constraints, like what, you know, what is their significance amount to? Well, their significance amounts, amounts to just the amount of consequences it takes to override, override them. So then it's not a deontological theory because all these constraints are just sort of, you know, undergirded by these considerations about like, you know, what kind of consequences it would take to override those constraints. This is something people say sometimes. You guys have thoughts about that? Yeah, there's, they'd have to show that a contradiction is entailed by someone building the rules by any other possible means, right? I don't, I don't know what contradiction they're going to show. And if they can't show a contradiction, it's not clear why they get to say it's necessary in any, like, like logically speaking, like with in like yeah. logical modality like why they'd get guess, to say it's necessary that the rule construction is based on consequences right unless you can show it's contradictory for it not to be it's possible for it to be it's just kind of straightforward right yeah i guess these people are just trying to i think at least what these people are trying to point out is just that like that it seems that maybe the deontology is lost on that picture if you only try to talk about how serious the constraints are in terms of their consequences like the, the idea seems to be, I think that's what these people have in mind, is that they're missing, you're missing the ontological aspect of things when you do things that way. Well, well, yeah, like, if the way that you select your rules somehow bottoms out <clears throat> in utility, then you're just going to get, like, like it's just going to be, like, rule utilitarianism, right? Um, and I, I can understand maybe having some... Um, like an intuition or something that that's like how threshold deontologists must be determining which rules like matter more, like how they're setting up their rule scheme or whatever. But um, it's just an intuition and there's, there's no reason that I've ever seen given for why it must be done that way. Um, it seems like, it seems kind of just question begging. Like you're just assuming that they're using the very principle that like you, you want to argue for to set up their system. But You'd have yeah. to show that, right? And uh, you'd have to show that, or, or like the the. Well, okay, I was gonna say more, but yeah, if you if you can't if you can't show that's actually what they're doing, then I don't think you get to assert that's what they're doing. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I was right about this. <laughs> this is you know something I argued for in in, in uh, you know one of my papers uh, back back then a few years ago. Uh, but I mean, one thing I tried to say in response to this kind of thing again, I don't know if this works. Um, I haven't thought about it much since. But like one thing I say is that like look when. Just look at how deontologists look at different constraints and they say things that like murder is more serious than lying, but they're, they're not talking about the consequences necessarily yet. They're just saying like, look, these two types of actions strike, like one of them strike us as more serious than the other. And we're not thinking about consequences at all at this point. It's just like murder just seems like worse than lying. I mean, you know, a consequentialist might want to say, oh, well, murder has worse consequences or torture, torture has worse consequences than, than lying does. But I mean, we, you know, the deontologist doesn't have to think about things this way. They might just think that those distinct action types are just somehow one is worse than the other um, without right. talking about consequences. And then if they're able to engage in that, if we, if we allow for that, if they're able to engage in those sorts of comparisons, then they can later go on to say that, oh, because uh, torture is intrinsically more serious or more wrong than lying or something else, then we had better say that it's going to take more consequences to, you know, make it permissible <laughs> than, you know, or worse consequences that we'd have to prevent to, you know, justify violation of, right. of that constraint rather than some other one. So it's like the idea seems to be, I think this is something I say in my paper. Again, I'm not sure if, if this is entirely right or if this is the best way to think about it, but you might think that like the attention is first and foremost on the deontological sort of components it's like how serious are these things like how how you know how serious do they strike us and then now later on once we've decided how serious they are like then we can talk start talking about like what it would take to sort of you know outweigh them what sort of instrumental or consequentialist considerations might uh, outweigh them right um um one other so I guess that's one way. Again, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how plausible that. Okay, I'm not sure how plausible anything is. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm always like sounding like very like not confident about what I say because you know philosophy is hard. <laughs> sure. But but uh, but can one we come thing back on that before before we we advance? Because I will. I'll, yeah, go ahead. I have some things to say to that before we lose it. Um, okay. So the first is you you totally, as far as I'm concerned, hit the nail on the head with the sentence. They don't. There's, they don't have to do it like that. You said something like that, right? And and have to is what's of interest to me there, right? Because that's that's 
going to connect to some kind of like modality like does that have with respect to physical modality metaphysical modality if you think that makes sense logical modality and the thing is like unless it's about logical modality i don't see why i should care and given that it is about logical modality if they have to there's a contradiction if they're not doing it what's the contradiction if you can't show it you don't get to make the claim that's sort of how it all you know that's how it all hashes out for me um yeah I got you. that that makes sense um so this is actually still related to this is one thing i was going to say is uh i think it was uh krista johnson is this person who wrote a paper called what's the paper called it's called something like how deontologists can be mod or deontologists can be moderate and why they should be something like this um it was actually published in the same journal as as my paper but uh uh krista argues that um that we can like remain like thoroughly deontological even on the moderate deontology picture because i think the idea it's been a while since i looked at the paper but i think um i think the idea is something like we you know part of what uh sort of justifies talks of like rights and duties and constraints is like there's this notion of like you know people have integrity and we want to respect people's integrity and we want to respect each other and part of what it is to respect one another is you know to not lie to each other and torture each other that like you know, violates our autonomy and like, you know, disrespects us, you know, these sort of Kantian ways of talking like that's one way of thinking about like what's going on when we're talking about like why these constraints are in place. And then uh, they go on, Krista goes on to argue that like, when we think about what sort of consequences uh, it would take to override those considerations, like how, you know, how bad the consequences have to be to sort of outweigh, you know, this consideration about respecting someone um, or, you know, not violating their integrity or something in, in whatever way we're imagining. Krista argues that, like, look, what we can do is, like, look at the consequences. There are people or, you know, whatever, you know, some kind of creature who's people. Uh, I mean, usually, you know, in terms of people, there's people in these consequences. They all have dignity or they all have integrity. And one way of respecting someone's integrity is acknowledging them and sort of taking them into account whenever you're, you know, you're, whenever you're performing your actions, whenever, you know, just noticing that people are affected by your actions it's one way of acknowledging them and respecting them, right? So Krista argues that like even when a constraint is 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 outweighed by like a certain set of consequences, it's not because like we need to think of these considerations as like utility maximizing considerations or anything like that. It could just be like, hey, to respect everybody's integrity, like, you know, uh, or acknowledge everyone's integrity and the consequences, it might sometimes require us to, like, disrespect someone else or, you know, to torture someone or something like that. So that's a way that, and again, I'm not sure if this works either, but this is a way that uh, I think, uh, like, the Krista tries to keep the theory really, you know, thoroughly deontological throughout by even talking about the consequences in terms of, like, the integrity of people and the consequences and trying to respect them and acknowledge them. So that might be another way in which you might try to make the theory really, uh, you know, not so consequentialist looking. Okay, I have, I have like, a comment that kind of connects to that and to the last thing you said. And I, I maybe Avi will have something more directly about exactly what you just said. But th there's just another problem here, which is, like, say, say that we don't know the mechanism, right? Say that we don't know exactly how those deontological considerations are um given weight or whatever like how, how which ones are determined to matter and to what degree say say we're not sure about that it not it doesn't follow from that that they need be established by some kind of utilitarian means right like why would why would that yeah. follow <laughs> so it's it's like even if we don't know the mechanism, it still doesn't get the other side to this point that it must be done in some utilitarian way. And Avi, I don't right. know if you had something more directly about that last point. No, I didn't. I didn't have any more. Um, I didn't. I don't think I had any more to add on that. Actually, wait. In terms yeah. of what? Wait, just to be clear, what? When you say that last point, which? What are you referring to? so tyler made two points um so the first one we were talking about there was um sorry now i'm getting a bit lost the first one we were talking about we we're talking about um when the threshold deontologist is setting up their like deontological rules um they don't need to be doing that like consequent here in fact tyler why don't you repeat both of the points because now they're they're escaping my brain you can probably do it better Sorry, are you are you talking about the idea that like deontologists don't have to necessarily look at or it, you know they they pay attention to the constraints first 
and then like try to evaluate the stringency of constraints like first and foremost and comparing them against each other and seeing which ones strike them as more serious is that the thing you're talking about um the, well the, i think that was the first point but you had just you had just made another sorry my brain sometimes doesn't backtrack yeah well. it, the other yeah. thing was like the other thing was like so one way of thinking think about it's like okay we look at the constraints first and we try to evaluate how serious they are intrinsically and try to measure them or you know compare them against each other like we say torture is worse than lying and it's like intrinsically more wrong to torture than to lie and then you might think okay well now that we've established that now we can say things like oh well it better be the case that it takes more consequences or worse consequences to override uh, you know, uh, violating the constraint against torture better take more severe consequences to override that constraint than the constraint against lying. Um, so then that might be a way of like, okay, we look at the consequences later. Like, but first and foremost, when we're thinking about how serious the constraints are, we only focus our, you know, attention on like the intrinsic wrongness of violating them, you know, the deontological side of things like that, you know, that might be one way of doing it. But then I, as I mentioned, Another way is like this way Chris, Krista Johnson talks about. And yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not this is 100%. the second point. This is what I was calling number two right here, the Krista Johnson thing. Sorry. Okay, yeah. I'm not, again, I'll have to look back at the paper. It's been a while. I'm not 100% sure that this is exactly what Krista has in mind. But I think the thought is that, like, when you're respecting someone, when you're not violating a constraint against, like, lying or torture or whatever, or using someone as a mere means, like, that's a way of respecting them, right? That's a way of, like, as Kant says, that's a way of, like, treating them as an end or as an end in, in, in themselves. It's like you're respecting a person or respecting their dignity or whatever when you don't treat them in these in these bad ways. And and Chris argues that like, oh, look, well, when the consequences get real severe and like they override, you know, these these ways of, that we should be treating people with dignity or respect or whatever. Um, uh, like we don't have to think about this in a, in a utilitarian way or it's like, oh, you know, a lot of well-being is at stake. Instead, you might say that, oh, look, here's a lot of people in these consequences, and they ought to be respected, and they have dignity. And, like, one way of respecting people is acknowledging that, like, something you do is going to have some effect on them. It's going to affect their way of life. So, like, although normally you shouldn't, you know, go around torturing and lying to people, you might think that, like, if enough, you know, autonomous creatures' lives are at stake or, you know, however you want to put it, um, like, you know, that might require you to acknowledge them. And to say that they have some weight in what you do, and like that's a way, of, you know, that's a deontological thought. If you're thinking about acknowledging them and respecting them by like taking them into account and in, in, in your in your reasoning. There's, there's one thing now that's striking me about that, which is someone might try to suggest that you're just embedding a concern for preference utility. Um, but I mean, if if you somehow cash it out in terms of like respect, though, and it it doesn't, it's not like just sliding you know preference utility in there then yeah i mean that's I mean, yeah that's... well yeah here's the ultimate question the question is can can res is respect e in this system equivalent to preference utility because if it is then you're just sliding that in if it's not then we can just but if it's not then we can just give the case where there is um a difference in preference utility without the difference in respect and just give the same example right Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, well, let me say one other thing. OK, well, first of all, again, I'm not 100 percent sure that that's that those are all the details of Chris's view. I think there's a little more to it. You can check out the paper if you want. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go back and look at it, make sure I got it right. Uh, but uh, another thing that uh, I mentioned this briefly in my paper, I mentioned like this idea that you might regret uh, violating a constraint, even when it's the all things considered right action. I, I This is something I think I briefly mentioned in my paper, but Krista talks about this more uh, uh, in, in their paper. Uh, they say, or Krista says that, um, that like one way of respecting someone, like one way of still like remaining deontological with a theory is like, look, like even when you have to torture someone because the consequences are severe enough, like you should still, like we would think it's weird if someone's like excited to torture somebody in order to save a bunch of people. Like that's a terrible thing that they have to do to save a bunch of people, right? And it's a really, it's like a deontological thought that like you should feel regret because you have done something bad. You've done something bad in order to do the right thing. You know, you might think like you've done this thing that's normally really awful and intrinsically wrong in order to save a bunch of people. And it seems like one way of respecting that person is to feel some regret and like maybe, you know, make, you know, maybe make reparations for it after the fact. And like, that's one way of noticing that what you've done is like a deontological wrong that needs to be, you know, sort of made up for. Oh, yeah, I know. Absolutely. I'm in agreement with that. I mean, I, I would seem really like <laughs> horrific to, if someone were to just you know, save a whole bunch of lives and excitedly torture someone. Um, it exactly. would seem really weird. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, and I think that's what any threshold deontologist would do in that situation. Um, I don't think they would just somehow go eager, man maniacally eager and be like, oh, I'm going to torture you. And like, no, like that aspect of, <laughs> well, they'll be happy unless, about unless saving the had, line. But... What if you had a threshold deontological psychopath who's a moral realist? <laughs> oh, except for those, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but yeah, I mean, the point, the point, I mean, just going back to our original question, the, the point is just, you know, to, to emphasize this idea that like the theory remains deontological, even when it goes for the consequences, like even when the consequences are severe enough that they outweigh the constraint, the theory is still keeping that deontological element alive when it says like, look, there's some intrinsic wrongness here, despite the fact that it's the all things considered right action, there's still some wrongness here and it needs to be made up for after the fact it, it makes sense for the agent to feel bad about what they've done. They should feel, you know, in one sense, like they should be like, you know, proud of themselves that they, you know, were able to sort of get, you know, conjure up the strength or whatever to, to, to do the right thing. But it was hard to do the right thing precisely because it involved this deontological wrong, this bad thing that they had to do. And so it makes sense for them to feel bad about it after the fact. So that deontological component is still there beyond the threshold. Let me put it that way. It's right. still there. Right. Yes. Still yeah, there. of course. Right. And, and we, yeah, this is just to say like, yeah, there's, even if the action comes out being overall good, the deontological consideration still amounts to a protonto reason against it, right? And if right, and this is exactly, what the graph exactly. is basically showing. I'll exactly. post the graph in general, exactly. and I'm like, yeah. So, so Ty, if you look at the graph, notice even in when the action is really good, it's still less quote unquote good than the amount of good it is on a consequentialist view. That's yep. Be, yep. beyond the threshold thing that the graph is showing. Good. Right. I think we we all agree on that. So yeah, we all agree on that. On that. We all right, cool. Next? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next question is, oh, here's, uh, so how does one go about determining the threshold? Oh, don't ask me that. <laughs> well, and, that's that's the million dollar question. Right. Well, and there could be a, a some other more, um, that question assumes there's a threshold, <clears throat> right? It could be. Right. It could be that we're dealing with like, a sorties kind of thing or a vague predication kind of thing and really that solving the threshold would require solving these other problems in philosophy um and if if we look at the different kinds of views on offer there which you know i don't know much about this but there's views like epistemicism i think that's where there is a point but you don't have epistemic access to it um or there's views where there's not a discrete point um uh, this is just for any sorties case there's not a discrete point um so you actually need to use like a fuzzy logic um so there's different there's different ways to approach that but not all of them assume that in these kind of vague predication like sorties kind of situations that there is in fact a discrete point so it's almost worth rephrasing the question like given that there is a discrete point, how do we go about determining it? Because threshold deontology, the word threshold makes you think discrete point, but I think even if you if you grant those, those kind of sorties, vague predication type concerns apply, and that there might not be like an exact threshold, you might have to use a fuzzy logic or something. We're still talking virtually about the same thing, and that shouldn't stop us from calling it threshold deontology. Yeah, I think I've encountered people, I think more realists in my experience are more inclined, you know, they'll say that like, oh, when it comes to, you know, how many grains of sand it takes to make a heap, or like how many hairs on someone's head they need to not be bald or whatever, you know, these kind of vague mm -hmm. sort of cases that we, you know, we, we encounter, they'll, they, they, they'll say, oh, well, you know, uh, we don't want to be epistemicists about that. That would seem weird. There's something, some exact number that it takes <laughs> yeah. to make a heap. But insofar as they're more realists, typically they think, no, there just is some right answer. Like there is some, like there is some amount of, of, of badness or something that like that, you know, could make the difference. And like, you know, uh, it, we just don't know what it is. So I, I hear people talk this way sometimes. I should I should say that like, yeah, I don't, I, I can't tell you what the number is. <laughs> I can't tell you what the number is on how many lives need to be at stake, to, uh, at stake in order to justify a torture. But I will say that like one thing that I pointed out uh, in my thesis that I wrote uh, was that I think that typically in these dis discussions, um, things seem really mysterious because people talk about like, oh, 99 lives isn't enough to justify a murder 
or torture, but 100 lives is, and all of a sudden the action that was just wrong is all of a sudden obligatory or required or whatever. Like, that seems weird and mysterious that that jump could, like, just suddenly take place from, you know, 99 to 100. But I think that really isn't – if you're really trying to capture, like, our intuitions and, and what, how we really think about things, that is not the best way at all. To, to, to formulate a threshold deontological theory, right? It seems that we need like a range of cases somewhere in the middle where our intuitions get a little bit fuzzy, right? And we're like not sure about whether the, the torture is justified or not. And when I argue in my thesis, and again, I mean, I'm not sure if this is right or not, but I think uh, one thing a threshold deontologist could say is that like, look, there's a range of cases in which like you could permissibly torture or you could permissibly not torture. And this is just indicative of these considerations are just lining up in seriousness, right? They're just coming to match in terms of their normative significance. And of course, they're not going to, you know, stay matched forever. There's a certain amount of consequences. There's a certain severity of consequences. Things are going to get bad enough that the constraints going to be outweighed. But it seems to me that insofar as like we take our intuition seriously about this stuff or, you know, our preferences, if you're Isaac, <laughs> then, you know, <laughs> okay. then, then we should really acknowledge that like there's a fuzzy range. And that seems to be, to me, it at least seems to signify that there's a range in which like either thing would be permissible, but at a certain point, you know, the, the torture becomes obligatory. Um, again, that doesn't answer the question of like where exactly the threshold is located. Yeah. But at least, at least does some progress, I think at least make some progress insofar as it shows that it doesn't have to be this mysterious like tipping point kind of structure. Uh, I think that's what I call it in my, in my paper. It's not this like tipping point thing. Instead, it's like, there's just more like a, like the threshold is more like a range of permissible options. Yeah. Um, and then what you will, you will, there is a further objection you can raise though about the beginning of the range looking like a mysterious weird point, but (laughs) yeah. Yep. I mean, I mentioned that. I, yeah, I think, yeah, it's definitely, it's like, okay, so uh, you can't tell me the exact number. All you can tell me is there's a range. So, okay, the tipping more, the tipping point mystery is gone, but now like, when does the permissibility start? And yeah. like, when does the obligatoriness start? And, like, I think that's right. And I definitely, definitely, definitely don't say anything to alleviate those concerns uh, in my paper. I'm just like, oh man, I don't know. People's intuition starting to get fuzzy and that's just evidence that the threshold's beginning, you know, and it's like at some point the fuzziness goes away and we know we need to torture if a million lives are at stake. And like, uh, OK, well, then, you know, obviously, you know, at that point, the the range ends. But like, I don't know that, I, that there's anything more to be said about it. I don't even know, like, yeah. what it would look like to say anything else about that. Well, and I think that I think an important thing to do here is to find out if the concern you're getting is actually a concern with threshold deontology, because in my experience, 99.9 percent of the time the person actually they just think they're raising a problem with threshold deontology but really it's a problem about sorties cases and you there if they were to follow their own reasoning that like there can't be like the i guess the idea is like unless you can break the symmetry with other cases, whatever you're saying about this is going to apply to like puddles and lakes and, and like grains of sand and, yeah. and stuff. So, you know, you don't want to say, well, it's impossible that we have these categories of like right and wrong or, or, you know, better and worse actions or whatever, given that we don't know the transition point because then they're going to be committed to like the non-existence of like lakes and puddles and all that kind of stuff also. Exactly. Like this is kind of a, I don't know if you've heard this strategy in meta ethics before, but there's a, a companions and guilt is what it's called. Oh God. Like, yeah. I don't, I'm not a, oh, I'm not a no. fan. <laughs> well, that's, that's what it sounds like what you're doing to be honest. It's like, look, there's like this kind of argument would also apply to heaps and puddles, but we think there are heaps and puddles. We don't know what the boundary conditions are exactly between not being a puddle and being a puddle. But like, we do think there are puddles and we do think there are not puddles so like why not apply the same sort of reasoning to the moral case is that not what you were saying the the strategy is the same i just think that there's i think that in the companions and guilt case you can just bite the bullet on there not being um um uh, like epistemic uh reasons in the sense they're talking about so I, i think that there's like an answer that kind of stops it from working backwards like that but yeah well, but, it's, but that's the, obviously the structure that's, is the same, though. Yeah, the structure is the same. Yeah, exactly. Right about that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Obviously, it's different what they're doing in meta ethics, but it seems like the structure is definitely the same. Um, and uh, I guess if you wanted to say, like, you know, puddles were somehow different than, you know, the moral case, 
if you want, you know, you might say epistemic normativity is somehow different from normal normativity and it makes epistemic normativity okay. Well, I guess if, if somebody wanted to use the same strategy with puddles and, and, and the moral, you know, the threshold case, so that's to say something that makes puddles somehow different right. um, with the vagueness from, you know, the moral case. And yeah. it's not obvious what that difference would be. Exactly. It's like you'd have to, you'd have to symmetry break on that premise that's kind of parallel to the, like, if there's normative reasons, there's epistemic reasons. Like there'd be some, some, premise that's similar to that with like if there's like td cases there's like put, put, okay i'd have to think about how to do it but the point is there's going to be one premise that's kind of the bridge or whatever that says like if you have these kind of things you have these kind of things um so someone could try to resist that break the symmetry and they might say well no you can have puddles and lakes for this kind of reason but that doesn't apply in the td case would love to see how someone would do that that sounds like a fucking challenge to, to right be <laughs> but right. um and then then the other the other options are just to like accept that threshold thing you can't raise any problem that you can't raise in the puddle case and then either be committed to like yeah yeah i guess you can either okay. You can either break the symmetry and then say puddles are okay, but the other isn't, or you can fail to break the symmetry and either say both are okay or neither is okay. So that that's the similarity yep. with the CIG, and I, I agree with that. I wasn't to be clear. Yeah, I wasn't right. laughing at the structure. It's form. It's formally valid argument if you set it up right. It's just the uh, right. some of the content of it. I'm like, oh, oh my. <laughs> Yeah, some people, some people are like, oh, well, so much the worse for numbers or epistemic normativity if it's just like moral normativity. Uh-oh, it turns out all that shit is like not good either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, my my whole take on that, we, this is another thing I could careen off on, is like if those epistemic reasons are are to be thought of in the same way as, as the normative reasons we're talking about, that is as, as being externally normative, I know I'm not convinced those exist, right? I don't I don't say that there's like a norm around like like being logical or something like this. I don't understand why that norm would apply to someone who has like no desire to be logical or like no desire to like trust their sense perception or whatever the epistemic norm is that we want to use. So I just but so this is my strategy, right? Given that we're talking about the same kind of norm, I just bite the bullet and say I'm not convinced those exist in the epistemic context, but given that we're talking about different kinds of norms then i say well wait we need we need support for the bridge premise why why do you get to keep one and not the other yep so so in short i guess avi uh i'm i'm terribly sorry i wish i could give you the uh the precise number wouldn't that be great <laughs> i uh, wish i could too no and, and i already i would have already written that paper that's for sure <laughs> yeah. there is one comparison <laughs> to make about what you said though ty which is that the kind of the kind of broad strokes sort of solution you gave there you you are noticing that commits you to like not being an epistemicist right yeah yeah although you might again it depends because you might think that there are these these hard boundaries um i mean i don't think that there is but you if if one person thought that yep there's a range of permissible options and there's a there's an exact point at which they both become permissible and there's an exact point at which you know becomes permissible to tor or obligated or obligatory to torture like that would be an epistemicist way of like being epistemist being epistemicist about you know the upper and lower boundaries but like saying like in the middle there's a bunch of permissibility you see what i mean um yeah so if you say that the the gray area has a discrete starting point that you don't have epistemic access to you're being an epistemicist about that thing now and yeah thing. like that's the idea yeah so it's not there's no indeterminacy on this picture actually i mean everything is everything is just it's like permissible or not and it's just like you might think well, we just don't know it's like the evidence the evidence is like our fuzzy intuitions but it's not like this fuzzy logic kind of thing it's just like our intuitions we just aren't really sure at a certain point and maybe that's evidence like that's where it's oh. at so okay, really wait. Knows? I might have misunderstood you. Are you saying there is a fact of the matter about all cases, but we're just epistemically barred from it? Or are you saying there's actually areas where in principle, like even if we had all full knowledge, we wouldn't we wouldn't have an answer to whether the thing is right or wrong? Yeah, I'm not. Well, first of all, I'm not saying that they're definitely I mean, again, I'm not I don't know that I'm a threshold deontologist. I think it's a cool theory. I'm not sure if I actually believe it. But um, but I think that like that's one view one could have. That's all I'm trying to say is like one view one could have is that like our intuition is starting to get fuzzy at a certain point, and that's indicative that the permissibility is starting, the permissibility of going either way. But maybe maybe there's a fact of the matter, but we just don't know it. 
But then another way of thinking about that is like, oh, no, there is a fact of the matter. Maybe it is indeterminate. But like the permissibility, you know, it's somewhere in there. Uh, I'm not sure, um, actually. actually. You can have, yeah, I know, I get what you're saying. You can have like within the gray area, you can have this view that there is a fact of the matter of its moral status and we just don't know it. Or you can say in the gray, the gray area just represents the area where we um, are where there may not be a fact of the matter or there may not be, or, or that there is now no fact of the matter about its moral status. Like there, yeah, I understand how a threshold deontology could take different views on that. And, and there's no, there's no distinction working with that or working with puddles and lakes, right? There, there might be an exact area where a puddle becomes a lake or there might not. It could be that there's some kind of gray area in the middle and a threshold where it becomes gray or not. Like, like everything can be said in both cases, right? So like the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned on all of this is just, break the symmetry with puddles and lakes or, you know, lose both or keep both. And that's kind of yeah. how, how to deal with it as far as I'm concerned. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely no expert on vagueness. I mean, you know, I know some of the literature, but I'm inclined to think that when it comes to the puddles and the heaps and baldness and things like that, I'm inclined to think our language just underdetermines, uh, you know, sure. uh, facts. I don't think our language just, you know, again, it underdetermines it. It just doesn't, there's no fact of the matter that would be decided by our language. Our language is kind of fuzzy, right? Or it just doesn't decide the matter. Whereas again, the thought though, is that if you want to be a moral realist, you might think it's a little hard to say, a little harder to say. You might think that, no, there are facts of the matter here. And maybe it's just really hard and complicated to figure it out. But maybe there are some hard ethical facts about, See, you know, th when the permissibility begins and ends or whatever. Th that feels so weird to me. Cause like, I, I understand as a moral realist, like, you know, maybe you, you you have some general attraction to their like being answers to moral questions like that. That's like it's, it seems good. To, sorry, how do I say this more clearly? What seems weird to me about that is that a moral realist is like just as much a puddle realist, but doesn't find a problem in that context. Right. So it's like it's not clear why the realism should generate any kind of problem for well, the threshold stuff. If if you're um if you're attracted to like the kind of thing I was saying earlier, I mean, suppose, I mean, if you think that when it comes to puddles and heaps and baldness, that the indeterminacy is just a result of like our language, like not, you know, deter under determining it or whatever. Like when it comes to the moral truths, you might think, look, our language doesn't have anything to do with it. There's this like facts out there. Like, it's not like the heap and the baldness, like there's facts out there that we're trying to grasp. And it's just really hard to grasp those facts. And they're independently of our language and our contingent attitudes well, but they're out there like that i think the realist is going to think in that way and that's why it's going to sound like they're going to be more attracted to epistemicist uh views on this matter i'm not totally I'm not, I'm not i'm not saying that they're wedded to that way of thinking about things but it seems to me that that's a natural way uh of thinking about these issues if you're if you're kind of moral realist but i guess that what i'm not understanding is in the case of of the puddles and stuff i mean I, I guess I don't get how one case on their view, there's supposed to be like a fact of the matter we're trying to figure out. And on the other, there's not like how, what, what is the, the disanalogy there? Sorry, what's the disanalogy between like the puddles and, yeah, and the threshold? I didn't, I didn't really follow what you're saying there. Cause it sound it sounds like, cause like the point I made was just, it seems weird that like, presumably a realist is equally a realist about morality and about, you know, various like facts about the world. Like, like, you know about puddles for instance like whether it contains fish or not or something like that like presumably they're a realist about both kinds of questions and wait why though oh i was just i mean i was just assuming that you'd be like just a realist generally what do you want to talk about someone who's like a realist about morality, about yeah, morality there are about some that? yeah there are some people who are realists about morality and, and anti-realists about the unscientific anti-realists with stuff like that yeah. okay yeah, so, I, yeah mean, I mean yeah i guess it, all i was saying it was like you could be a more realist but you could be like a puddle anti-realist and I actually that yeah. actually feels crazy view to me <laughs> well i'm wait it, it doesn't seem like crazy view to you or it does because it, it seems to me like like you could you could be sure but i guess that i guess i'd be confused about what would like motivate a view like that i get i mean i was trying to motivate it a bit earlier I, or at least i took myself to be i mean i might you know one might just think that like look we talk about puddles and people being bald and things like this but like this you know like there's not really hard lines to be drawn it's like it's like the way we use language and we try to you know talk about different things but there's no like facts of the matter that our language is latching on to it's just like the indeterminacy is sort of a result of us not having determinate language to talk about that stuff 
Whereas when it comes to morality, like the facts about like what's right and what's wrong aren't like, you know, they, those aren't indeterminate and they don't result from like an indeterminacy in our language. Like there are really facts out there that are independent of our attitudes and whatever our language happens to be. And those are the things that we want to grasp. So I guess, I guess that's weirding me out a bit because like with the puddle, we don't, we think that there's, are you, are you like, are you just talking with someone who doesn't think that there's a fact of the matter about whether something is a puddle or not? Or like how many drops it takes to make a puddle, <laughs> how many uh, drops of water? Okay, and what is what is the reason that they think that there's um, there's a fact of the matter about how uh, about you know how many how many like pounds of force it takes for a punch to be like immoral, but not how many drops of water it takes for you know a, um, a puddle to become like a lake. Well, they might think that like the amount of pounds of force or whatever is like it depends on how much like pain that produces or something like that. Okay, right. I, I so guess. Then would... Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I was just gonna ask more questions. If you if you're gonna explain more, that's fine. Well, I mean, I, I, look, I I haven't thought about this before. I'm just kind of you know doing this w with you here. I don't, I'm not sure exactly. All I'm trying to say is that like. It seems to me that someone could think that there are moral facts out there, and they're they're hard to figure out, but they're out there. Um, so this would be kind of moral realist, uh, and they think, okay, so these facts they're not like they don't they're not grounded in our attitudes, or they don't depend. They're like sort of somehow attitude independent, you know, like our attitudes don't just fix the moral truths. So they're out there to be discovered. Someone might think this way. But then they might think that like, oh, when we talk about puddles and people being bald, that's like like we're just trying to sort of, you know, conveniently sort of, you know, talk about the world. But I mean, I don't have to, have to really think that there's a fine line between being bald and not being bald. Like our language doesn't fix, uh, uh, you know, some it under determines. I think that's what the word I want to use there or it doesn't like fix the facts about that. But we don't have to worry about that because that's not like a property out in the world that's like independent of our language or something like that. I guess I'm just I'm that's just not computing for me like it seems it <laughs> seems like there's a fact of the matter about whether someone it, it seems I don't understand how there can be a fact of the matter about whether someone is okay so th I guess this is what I want to say I guess that it's like it's logically possible for there to be facts in the one case but not the other and it's possible for someone to take a view that that's the case in either direction um, that there's moral facts but not puddle facts or there's puddle facts but not moral facts so that's all fine but I guess what I don't understand and sorry if I'm if I'm looping the same territory I guess I don't understand what would motivate us to think that moral facts and puddle facts are are like distinct in that kind of way with the one that's about reality being moral facts Like, it's, is it, wouldn't we just say in both cases, we had, there's some, there's some objective reality about like, you know, if you're causing moral wrongness or if someone, you know, has a certain amount of hairs on their head and then we construct some language like, you know, moral or puddle or whatever. And the language is like imperfect in both cases and we do our yeah. best to apply it. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think about this more. I haven't, again, I haven't thought about this before, but I mean, you might, so Maybe there's a story someone wants to tell where they say, like, look, in the past, there were people with no hair at all, and there were people with lots of hair. And we call the people with no hair bald. We call the people with lots of hair, you know, not bald. <laughs> uh, and then there are cases in which maybe there was a couple of hairs on somebody's head, and we called them bald. Uh, but then a bunch more hair was not bald. But then in cases in the middle, it's like, I don't know, are they bald? They're not bald? I don't really know. Uh, you know, our language never really fixed, you know, fixed on that. And maybe there's not facts about, about that stuff. It's just like our language just doesn't, you know, or, we, or are you, you know, it's like there's no definition of baldness that decides the matter. Oh, maybe I might have just got you. I'm sorry. I, th I think I might get what you're saying. Sorry to, sorry to cut you off, but maybe I'll save you explaining it again. I, like, so is the idea just supposed to be like our cons our language baldness, that term is vague in a way that the moral term isn't like the moral term. Let's just say that just refers to whether the like wrongness property is like there or not. It's just some binary yeah. thing. Right. Okay. So you're, yeah, sorry. I don't know why that was so confusing. Right. So you're literally, you're just talking about how vague the word is. Maybe, 
maybe the word bald is vague in a way that the word moral isn't like baldness refers to who knows we can't we can't tell when you've got you know between this and this amount of hair it's just not clear but with the moral term it's like the moral property is just either present or not it's like on or off switch there's no like gray area even if epistemically yeah an access problem yeah you might think that like we don't have a definition of baldness that would decide the matter okay uh, sorry i agree like yeah i, I, I mean yeah so again, well let me let me just stress uh, uh, again i'm not this is one way of thinking i mean this sounds somewhat plausible to me but I, I, yeah i'm not totally sure uh, at the end of the day if if that's where i'd want to go with it but i think i think that's at least one reasonable way of trying to distinguish uh, the two cases oh yeah i'm to be clear i'm i'm of course not signing off on it because i don't think there are even these moral things i i just um i uh i'm just granting that i now know what you mean i understand what you're saying now and it's, gotcha. it's not i don't see a logical problem with it i'm not I'm right you don't view, though yeah it's, it's not a crazy view is what it doesn't seem like something that's like obviously weird or something um yeah, well, certain things do seem weird about it, but it doesn't seem logically contradictory. Um, and I, gotcha. I can understand what gotcha. might like motivate. It. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for the hang up on that. Um, yeah. Um, so, right along? Sure. Sure. Yeah. In terms of like gauging, um, so we can't determine. Uh, so obviously, it's going to be almost impossible to determine. Well, at least very hard to determine exactly where the threshold is. But in terms of getting like a rough idea of of where it might be. Um, for a subjectivist, do you think any sort of epistemic particularism would be helpful? Like someone who would say like, okay, you know, just because I don't know how it is that I have these preferences or desires or whatnot. Um, sorry to use the word preferences. Just because I don't know how it is that I have certain desires or values, it doesn't change the fact that I still know them. So just like with like ice cream, um, I may not... Uh, know how it is that I know that I like chocolate over vanilla. I don't know exactly how the taste receptors interact. I don't know how, how exactly which action potential ends up where in my brain. But it doesn't really prevent me from knowing that I like chocolate over vanilla. And I maybe I could combine different amounts of chocolate and vanilla. I don't know exactly how many drops of chocolate or vanilla will take for me to like it versus not like it. But I have this, there is, a, there is a vague idea of the matter. Sorry, there is a, some vagueness there. But in terms of knowing where it is, I don't have to know how I know where, where it is in order to know that I know, have this rough idea of where it is. That in one case, it's, it's obviously that I like it. In one in case, other, it's obvious that I don't. Can the threshold deontologist take that same like epistemic particularist approach? to answer how they know like this is a clear area and the other is a clear area? Let's see. So you're saying, let me make sure I'm clear on this. So you're saying that like maybe a, uh, a person could say, look, I think uh, that a hundred murders is, is enough uh, to justify a torture to prevent, uh, you know, a hundred murders. Now don't ask me, <laughs> don't ask me to like say anything about how I know that or like, you know, for any kind of further argument or, or like justification for that belief. But it's like it, it's just what I what I believe. Is that what you're saying? Because if if someone's, I take it if someone's a subjectivist, the truth maker is their is their is their attitude toward it. Yeah. It's, and so when someone says like, "How do you know that that's your view?" It's essentially saying like, "Well, how do you know that that's your attitude toward it?" Right. And someone may not. In that case, it seems like someone may not have to know exactly like how it is their attitude towards something to know that it is their attitude towards something. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. This, this touches, I mean, this definitely touches on some like deeper issues in, a, in epistemology, like namely like to know that P, do you have to know that you know that P? Um, yeah. Uh, people wonder about sometimes. Right. Um, but I think that, I don't know. So suppose you're a subjectivist and like your attitudes just settle the matter. Uh, suppose you think that that's the truth. Then like, Okay, so you might think that, like, okay, because my attitude is that, like, or because my belief or attitude is that, like, a hundred murders or a hundred lives at stake is enough to justify um, a torture. Like, that's, you know, that's just it. That's just where it's at. It's like, that's just what I believe. That's what my attitude is. I mean, one way of trying to to maybe show this person that, that, that that's actually not what they believe or what, what they're committed to is, like, if you could find other cases... I mean, this is related to some things uh, we were talking about earlier. Like, if you could show that, like, that actually is in tension with some other things they believe. Because, um, you know, we, I think that yeah. sometimes we are incoherent and it's not obvious to us. And we do have, you know, we have contradictory beliefs, right? So, at least sometimes. And, like, so 
there might be a case in which someone says a hundred lives is enough, but then you look at other parts of their parts beliefs, of right. belief, other things they believe, and it turns out that like they shouldn't. If they do think that, they shouldn't think that uh, mm-hmm. because it conflicts with some other things they believe. And then maybe the threshold should be located where they think it is at the moment. Do we think? So I I, I grant all that, but do do you think that um, a subjectivist would have to be able to say how it is they know that they're attitude is towards something to know that their attitude is towards something i guess that's the question i'm i'm asking because it's like a subjectivist can be to say okay i'm a threshold deontologist and they say okay well how do you know where like where the threshold is well i don't know exactly okay well how do you know where the gray area is well i don't know exactly where the boundaries of the gray area okay well how do you give me a rough how do you know where the even ballpark area is like with even without discrete bounds and then they would say like, okay, well, I don't know exactly, but I can tell you that this is a clear area and that's a clear area. And the reason I can tell you is because I have dispositions toward that. I, sorry, I have like an attitude towards that and that's the, on subjectivism, that's the truth maker. And then the response yeah. to that is, well, yeah. well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know? And the question is, do, do, they ha- do they have to even know that to know that, right? Do they have to know how, th- how it is they know, how it is that their uh, attitude favors one over the other to know that their attitude favors one or the other yeah i, I worry i worry that if you didn't take the person seriously and you're like oh well how do you know that your attitude is that like that would really seem to introduce a, a really radical like skepticism about right. like about yeah. affection and people being able to introspect like their own yes. attitude towards things and that seems like that's something we want to avoid i think that that is exactly the kind of way that i would want to reply to that because you'd and it's another symmetry breaker thing right it's like how are you gonna if if all it comes down to for the subjectivist to to know something is that um they know it is their attitude uh, or they have a positive attitude towards you know such and such thing if, if all that's required for them to to know that it's good is to know that they have that kind of preference towards it or whatever it's like if you start questioning whether they have like access to their own like mind or something yeah like i guess maybe that's a slight hyperbole yeah if you start talking about if you start doubting it's like it's like this idea no i I agree i agree there's a way i can say it though because alex alex malpass who i don't know if you know him or not tyler he has he has a great way of talking about this but i think he the way he put it was i think he was saying that you can like pull out of this like toolkit i think this is alex of like skepticism uh, in order to like try to like you know get around certain problems or, or whatever but there's there's this danger of like you pull out like a tool that also then like chops up a ton of other stuff and that's kind of like the the fear here right it's like okay like yeah i guess you can try to like raise this issue with how how td person you know knows something is good and something is bad without knowing the threshold or whatever by questioning like if they even have access to their own preferences but like what else is that gonna do like what other things are we now gonna yeah be of to, right so i i yeah, I, so I, I think that kind of response that seems right to me yeah yeah i think i mean some philosophers would say like look like our knowledge of our own mental states is about that's about as certain as we can be about anything <laughs> is that like we prefer certain things or like you know have certain have, things yeah. certain things it's like and if you want to start being skeptical about that it's just like oh we're in trouble here now okay. yeah so I think so I think I am a, an epistemic particularist with respect to those kind of things for sure. Okay. Cool. Um and then let's, let's the other be, can, can we just be clear about that for one second? So when you say you're an epistemic particularist about those kind of things, you mean about about what specifically about um knowing uh that one thing is good and one thing is is bad while not knowing the on a subjectivist well, yeah, yeah, on a subjectivist view. Like I know like I could know that I have um, I can know that things are right on a subjectivist view and wrong on a subjectivist view without, or at least indexed to me, without knowing how I know that. Because all it means to know that is to know that I have um, an attitude toward it. Give well, an then you do, you do know how you know it then. You know that's what you think, right? Well, does right, he, but I don't, does, I don't know how that's what I think. Yeah, does he right? know how, how he has access to his own mental... Like, it, seems like, it seems like a silly question almost, but... I don't know how I would answer that. How how do you know that you have access to your own mental states? It's like, it's like right because I, I could know I, that I, I have I access. Respect and there they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that, there is there is like the I, like are you just asking so the point I'm making 
Yeah, the point I'm just making is that I don't, I could know what my, I can know that I have access to my mental states without knowing how that I have access to my mental states. That's what I can mean by epistemic particularism for that question. Right. And, and uh, just a slight off topic thing here is you, you might not want to commit all the way to epistemic particularism if that has any entailment about knowledge, right? Because like, is, is it about how you know things or can it just be about beliefs? Because knowledge is a whole other can of worms you might not like i guess this is a bit beside the point but you might not want to commit yourself to a view on knowledge if you haven't like given a lot of thought to it mm -hmm. yeah you could at least say you have some justified beliefs about right. what that, you're that's you like, yeah, that's, yeah that's like a bit yeah that's like okay. a bit but it's like safer basically yeah so the other okay cool um no i i, I agree with all that the other so this is a more interest i think this will probably be we're getting into the more interesting questions now because we had to get a lot of like nonsense out of the way um but here's a more interesting one is threshold deontology a form of value pluralism so it would seem on face value that we're just you know we're taking like a value of one thing the consequences of the utility and a value of another thing namely the the rights and it seems like we're just valuing two things and we and we do have an ordered way of you know adjudicating how much we value more or another, and we can have an ordered way of determining the moral value of the action in question when combining both of them. And then we can have some way of asserting if it's right or wrong, fine. But is what we're doing value pluralism then? Or is it not value pluralism? So that would be that question. Okay, so so I think, you know, I people talk differently about this in the philosophical literature, like pluralism and monism, and you know, these terms get thrown around in different contexts. I mean, one way, one way of thinking about this is like, depending on how coarse grained or how fine grained you go with your discussion of things, you might get different answers. So if you're talking about just like how many different kinds of things matter, morally speaking, then you might think that, okay, well, deontological things matter and, you know, uh, utilitarian things matter or, you know, those sorts of considerations matter, utilitarian considerations. And, uh, and so what, I'm a value dualist. <laughs> like those are the two things that like fundamentally matter. Maybe I'm some kind of like dualist or something like this. Or you might think that like, um, I don't know. You might think that like lying is bad. Uh, torturing is bad. Murdering is bad. And it's like, am I a pluralist now? Because I think there's a number of dance. Like, am I a dance? Oh, a I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah that you makes a lot I mean? of sense. So yeah, depending yeah. on how coarse grained we are with our analysis, we might say a certain thing counts as like value, pluralists or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a question of semantic scope. Yeah. You it's, might, in, yeah, you yeah. might think about it that way. I mean, in, 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 so in like the well-being literature, for example, like the debate goes this way, right. Just to, to kind of illustrate, they're like, okay, well, when it comes to well-being, is there more than one thing that like fundamentally makes a life go well? Well, the hedonist says, well, no, there's just one thing, namely pleasure or happiness, right? Like that's the only thing that matters. So they're like a monist. And then you might have like an objective list theorist who's like, no, friendship matters and, you know, achievement matters and uh you know uh, all these other things matter and so like you would think oh well that person's a pluralist but i mean if you think okay well what matters morally speaking does just well-being matter okay well am i a monist because i only think well-being matters but am i also a pluralist because i think there's like an objective list and there's a number of things that contribute to well-being so it really just, it just uh, ah yeah, yeah i got it yeah the whole question yeah yeah, I see. I can totally see now, like why that whole question is like <laughs> that whole question seems so like um, so it's just going to boil down to the semantic of scope because no matter what, yeah, it might it just theory. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, it, it, yeah, you're right. It just depends on like the level of grain. You might think is a way to think. Yeah. About, uh, because if you're a utilitarian, you can just say like, okay, well, <laughs> if you care about utility, like, are you? Are you a pluralist because you care about all these different things, aspects of utility? Like, and if you're a, um, a threshold deontologist, it's just like saying, okay, well, are you a pluralist because you you care about all these different aspects of threshold deontology? If you're a deontologist, are you a pluralist because you care about all these different rules? Like, why do you like? It's not like you have one rule. Um, you have, I mean, deontologists have numerous rules. And yeah they value and and sometimes they value those different rules differently um so but no one would yeah but we it would seem it would seem on its face like crazy to call them value pluralists even though now that we, we're i'm thinking about it, it doesn't seem that crazy because 
it seems i don't so yeah i know i i totally i see what you're saying now so it seems to just be a question of scope and now the whole thing just seems like a, a meaningless question yeah well i i should say i mean i think that debates about whether pluralism or monism is true in some domain it's, it's not like we shouldn't think those debates aren't important as long as people are clear about what they mean right it's like as long as you're clear on the terminology it's like are you talking about like what sort of things you know are good for me fundamentally or like or how many things there are like that or like you know like what what's the level of grain here it's like as long as we're clear on those questions when we're talking about monism and pluralism i think they're you know questions to think about and like they're not like you know dumb questions or anything like that but i mean yeah i mean even with like ross's theory ross is oftentimes ross is called a deontological pluralist and like oh well why is he deontological pluralist because he posits a plurality of different duties right there's you know right. he's a fidelity and beneficence and all the rest right but is he but then you might take a step back and say oh but is he a pluralist in the sense that like he cares about virtue ethical stuff too and you know uh, these other things too he's like you might think oh well no if you want to talk if you want to step if you want to zoom out a little bit maybe he's a monist in the sense that he only cares about the ontological stuff so you know, as you can see like it, it, like yeah. it, it can just can really it all depends really on what you're defining as pluralism what scope you're operating on it's yeah like, uh... and it, yeah, I just I just want to say I don't I don't think it's like stupid to have that conversation. Again, it's just like it depends on like you know just making sure you're clear on the terminology, and then you know it can be useful yeah. to have this conversation. You, you know, we need a, a word for this category of questions, but there's certain questions that are basically answered once you ask them clearly enough, and it sounds like we're talking about that kind of question here. It's like right. asking the question clearly involves like clarifying the scope you're talking about. But once you clarify the scope, it's like, well, what, what more is there to do to answer this? Yeah. yeah. The next question we have is, is threshold deontology best described as a piecewise or non-piecewise function? That is to say, does threshold deontology value deontic rights up until threshold T upon which the consequences are values and the deontic rights are no longer values? Or does a threshold deontologist value deontic rights and continue to value said deontic rights up until threshold T, upon which the pro tanto reasons of utility surpass the weightiness of the initial deontic value? Now, I have an obvious view on this. My, my view, but I'll, I'll let um, Tyler answer. Yeah, well, I, I think that I've already, you know, just given things yeah, we, that I said earlier, I already kind of, you know, uh, spilled the beans on what I thought about, yeah. you know, in saying that like the wrongness, the intrinsic wrongness, you know, it still exists beyond the threshold. It doesn't yeah. go away, right? Exactly. So yeah, my view, yeah, and Sims like your view as well, is that threshold deontology is not a, um, it is not a piecewise function. That it is a, it's a non, it's a non piecewise function at all points. There is consideration for the deontic violation as well as the consequences. Yeah. And then and the, let me just say that like some people might think that like oh well you're just trying to keep the deontology there and this is just an ad hoc response to the you know the question of just like trying to keep the deontology really strong in the theory but there's no reason like someone might say there's no reason to keep you know to keep thinking that the wrongness is still there whenever the consequences take over so you know this is just some kind of ad hoc move that the threshold deontologist is doing but you know I, as i mentioned earlier i think there's like ev there's just evidence that like no we're not just trying to explain this one thing like there's plenty of evidence that the wrongness is still there when we look at how we think about people in these situations and in the sort of attitudes that we think people should have and the sort of things they should do after the fact like it makes sense for the person to go to the person that they had to torture and say i'm so sorry i had to do that like let me do all of these things to help you you know uh, get better yeah. and make amends like we wouldn't we wouldn't engage in that sort of activity i mean hopefully you never had to torture anyone <laughs> you know hopefully you never find yourself in that situation but we wouldn't think that like it would be appropriate for you to do things like that if we didn't think that the wrongness was still there like the intrinsic badness was still there once the consequences take it would make no sense for you to be doing all these things to help a person out after the fact or to make amends for it or, or, or uh, reparations if you thought that like there's just no wrongness whatsoever once the consequences took over because then what is there to regret what is there to feel bad for um so i think there's there's plenty of evidence that that uh, that uh to substantiate the claim that um that yeah there's still intrinsic wrongness there the rights still matter even beyond the threshold there's still significance to those things exactly okay um uh, i i agree um, completely i mean yeah go ahead you, you could I haven't thought it through, so you can't ask me questions about it, but you, you could presumably create some kind of TD model 
where the concern does just fully drop off at the threshold. It's not the kind of model I would hold to because I still, yeah. I, uh, I, just, I still like subjectively feel the weight of the wrongness. When I'm talking about you know murdering one person to save like you know a thousand or whatever. It's like that is still feels bad on some level. Like, so that's enough for me to say there's still some pro tanto reason against. But it, it doesn't seem like you need to have that kind of view to be a threshold deontologist. You could take some other kind of model, I guess. Right? Yeah, 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 certainly I someone think... could. But, I, but I, I don't think that would capture any of our um, models, nor I do, do I think anyone, do, most people at least, describing themselves as threshold deontologists. I really don't think that would capture their their attitudes. As, yeah, you know, because I don't yeah. Yeah, because look what the costs are. You you lose. You can't. There's so much that you miss out on being able to explain, <laughs> like you know the just the way people behave and the way we think it's appropriate for people to behave in these situations. Like you, you know, by dropping the significance of it beyond the threshold, it's like you miss out on being able to explain all this like stuff that we want to explain. Yeah, I, I just want to flag that I and I think we all agree that a view like that, there's no reason to think it's contradictory. Like someone could hold a view like that, but yeah, I I of course agree with your reasons for not holding a view like that. All right, awesome. And then we'll we'll let a few people because there are some people who want to ask questions. Um, uh, so if Spaghetti, we can invite Spaghetti Monster to speak. He's been wanting to come on mic and ask a question. So let's do that. So okay, do you have control? Okay, nice. Yeah. All right, Spaghetti Monster, you're here. Hey there, can you guys hear me? Yep. So this is actually uh, the professor from some previous debates. Um, the professor from some previous debates. So, uh, yeah, I, I debated uh, vegan games and recently uh, oh. uh, those annoying vegans. Oh, okay. We were going to have a debate, but I think we uh, we had some scheduling mishaps. Sure. But anyway, nice to I had meet a, you. Had a, nice to meet you too. Yeah, I had a um, I had a question about the threshold of the ontology. I was thinking a little bit about the plot that you guys made, and um, uh, it occurred to me that maybe there's a like a more clear way to plot it. Which is to actually plot the uh, moral value on the on the y-axis, like you do, and actually the offset d on the x-axis. Uh, and if you plot it that, if you plot it that way, if you draw a 45-degree line, objects with positive moral value, or objects that are moral, I would say. Sorry, I'm at the park with my kid. Um, objects that have a positive a positive moral value would be above the 45-degree line. An object with a negative would be below it. Are you talking so another about talking, line? Are Are you talking about actually replacing the x-axis with uh, like some some kind of line about deontology, or are you suggesting just changing the position of the deontology line so that it's parallel with the x-axis? You know, you replace the x-axis. Currently, the x-axis is a net utility. If yeah. I understand it properly, what I'm saying is replace that with d, the actual offset of of, uh, of breaking a deontological rule. So, so you have so you have on the y-axis, and you have the ontology on the x-axis, um, and a 45-degree line is where those two, you know, if they have the same units, I'm assuming they have the same units, that's where they're equal, right? So, uh, you know, that's that's exactly the threshold point, I guess you could say. Um, you don't have to have it be at 45 degrees if you want to make a non-zero threshold. You can have it be at some other angle, um, but 45 is kind of, I think, what you typically do. Um, you, and uh, sorry, I'm just confused. What? Have, how do you tell how much utility there is to an action that you plot if there's not a axis for utility? Now, the axis for utility would be the y-axis. How do you tell how much moral value there is? If there's That's not a moral the, value the axis. More, right, the moral value uh, is the difference between, basically it's the distance from um, where you end up for a net utility to the line, to the 45 degree line, okay. if you need to know that. I mean, it's, it's, so where I'm at is it's possible that something like that works. I can't actually visual like maybe if we sat here and talked through it, I'd visualize it and end up agreeing or disagreeing clearly. But what would be best if you have the time, if you have five minutes or something at some point, is just maybe draw it because then it would be easy to go, oh, okay, this is what he's talking about. Like we could we could try to understand it mentally by you describing it, but that can be pretty hard with graphs with like multiple lines and stuff. So I don't know if I can say. Anything yeah, I can't that. I can't draw right now, unfortunately, but maybe somebody else can draw it. But basically, y-axis is a uh, net utility, and x-axis is d, the threshold, or uh, you know, the the negative utility of, of breaking a particular rule. Okay. That's the full plot. Yeah, I. Um, so, so it's just it's fairly simple. Can 
Uh, so I, I can't visualize it off that. I'd have to see it. Avi, are you able to, to visualize to, it? From to what I, 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 I'm trying, um, but I'm not, I, I'm just not sure I would appreciate how it's getting the meshes that we're trying to get across and describe it, how we're trying to describe it. Um, but maybe I'm missing something. And so I do think it would be helpful at a later time to draw it out and show us and we can have a conversation about it. Um, because if yeah, there is something that's more clear than I, yeah, I'd be happy to consider it. Yeah, yeah, I we'll think the reason it's more clear of... is because uh, because uh, the current plot that you make now, um, if I understand correctly, it, you have to draw a new plot for every every like moral action that you're considering. So in other words, D needs to be able to change, right? So you can't actually make one plot that summarizes uh, the entire yeah, space I'll, of action. Yeah, I'll just grant what you're saying. <laughs> right what you're saying well, right well, now. Well, actually, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll just one second. Yeah, if if you if you have a way to plot it that works that gives the exact same information, but not just for one given action or, or an action with that level of deontic weight to it, but for all actions, that would be better because that does everything we're doing plus for the other actions. Yeah. Right? So, so if you- But I actually- if, Well, I, all I was going to say, sorry, Abby, is just if you actually can do that, I'd be interested to see that. So feel free to send it our way if you you know get a few minutes. Well, there's so something I'd want you to so watch, Spaghetti Monster, because there's actually, you can do it in a video and it would account for all the different like deontic actions. So here's a video of it um that someone just made i'm posting it in general it just chat. a video of the line moving up and down yeah it's <laughs> yeah. a video of the line moving up and down because like <laughs> if anyone wants to watch this video like this this basically is our plot just animated for different deontic actions oh for that's, different that's really nice the but the, i think the video the video aspect is cheating though if he wants to say he can give a better picture i will grant the better picture if, if he's able to yeah, yeah, yeah. The better picture yeah, yeah. If, if you can capture the info in the video but in a still frame definitely feel free to show us we'll probably switch to using it frankly if it's actually a better way to describe it yeah sure i, I, don't, I don't exactly know how to do that i'm kind of new to discord but um i'll do my best but it's, it's fairly simple i mean literally just plot uh net utility on the y-axis uh D on the on the x-axis, deontology occurs. You know, pure deontology occurs. At, okay, well, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to, I don't mean to cut you off, spaghetti, but it's just I my mind doesn't work well like that. It's a graph. I need to see it. So if you if you want to draw it at some point, or if someone else does, totally happy to look at it. But I don't think we're gonna. Uh, for me, we're not gonna get anywhere by discussing it. I could I could sit here trying to picture it, but it'll just it'll become slow and laborious. But I grant you what you're saying. If it does what you're saying it does, it works better. And if you have a few spare minutes at some point, just shoot us like a, a little image or whatever if you get a chance to draw one and we'll adopt it if it is better, which it might be. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, do we have other questions also? How, wait, sorry, how do I take someone off of... Um, oh, move to audience, okay. Cool, thanks, Spaghetti Monster, we appreciate that. Um, and then how... Do we have any others that we want to take, or do we want to go back to some of our questions? Also, uh, Ty, what's your what's your time frame like? Uh, let's see. When do we start this? One o'clock. Um, um... <laughs> oh, holy! Cr oh, wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah we've been yeah. going on for. If, if we really have. That's insane. Actually, I'm surprised. Really. I hope that you've enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I oh, we have. I have. Yeah. Like, I'm actually in awe. It's been three hours and twenty minutes. <laughs> Like, how'd that even happen? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to keep going, but we could also stop soon if you guys want. Yeah, I'm good to continue also. It's fine. I like the topic. We're just, uh, we're sensitive to your time. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we can keep going till our questions run out, frankly. So, uh, Avi, yeah, did if you, anyone Avi, in the audience has, I, I ran out of my questions. I mean, but if anyone has, uh, oh, if okay. anyone in the audience has any questions, then they're, they're free to, free to ask them. Yeah, paper. If you want to ask it, now's your chance. Like, oh yes. yeah, paper. <laughs> and I know papers had some some confusion or, or questions about the topic. Um, I'm not seeing any hands go up, so I mean, maybe maybe we do just call it there. That was very productive, and we it seems like it seems like we agree on a lot of these kind of major things. Not that they're, I, I don't think they're actually that difficult to figure out. Like the is it the same as R U or like. Is it just mashing two incompatible things together? Like, but yet that's where we get the pushback. So, you know, it's, it's good to be able to like fairly easily converge on those things. Yeah, I, uh, I really enjoyed it, guys. I thought it was really fun. Uh, I've never done anything like this before, so it was really, really cool. I was really excited to do it, and it went even, it went even better than I thought it would. Uh, I don't know what I was expecting, actually. <laughs> uh, 
So maybe maybe it didn't go better than I thought it would. It just went really, really well, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if you had no coherent notion of what it could be like, how could you know anything would be better or worse than that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although be careful when being invited to Discord AMAs. We, we happen to be a decent server, but there are some toxic cesspools, um, which will throw crazy, you know, Christian presuppositional lunatics at you to, like, yell at you. So beware. Um, any, okay. fi any final words from either of you guys here? I, I mean, I'm, I've said what I have to say. It was a great conversation. Happy to do it again. Yeah, I mean, well, thank, thanks so much, uh, Tyler, for coming on. And uh, yeah, look, it was an awesome conversation. And I hope to, oh, you know, hopefully it was sorry, sorry, to ruin sure. your, sorry to ruin your closing. We do have one question. It's from Cubelay. Oh, okay. So let's just take that quickly. Then we'll go back. Sorry. Uh, I sent you the invite to speak, Cubelay. You just have to hit OK on that. Hello. Go. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, sweet. Yeah, thanks for taking the question. Um, and I've no I know this question has annoyed you in the past, but is it like possible for you to give like some account of why specifically you even care about the rights? Like when I really introspect and try to think about why I even care about the rights, I like bottom out kind of in utility always and it seems hard to like even specify what a right is even supposed to be. Okay, well, I mean, for the first thing I'll point out is that you can ask the same question about why you care about utility, right? So if I ask you, why do you care about utility? What kind of answer would you give me? It seems like there's like this inherent value interaction when it comes to like utility, like it almost seems definitionally that we say pleasure is good, like something along the lines of like what a cosmic skeptic argument might be. Now, now setting yeah, aside whether... Said that's a good response or not why can't the threshold deontology yeah exactly that's what i was the same say. reply yeah do yeah you exactly think that, do you think that the pleasure that someone derives from torturing someone else is good do you think it's good when that pleasure happens well if it causes a lot of suffering then not but the right, pleasure but itself think, i guess the pleasure is intrinsically good wherever it occurs um i guess i would be I'm I'm personally not sure on this, like I'm still evaluating my own values, but I guess in a vacuum I it, it would be hard to say why it wouldn't be good. Of course, like in the real world it repels me to like think about someone torturing someone and that decreases my utility in the real world, like thinking about it. But that yeah, doesn't just, mean that in yeah, a vacuum I, just... I necessarily have the same view on it. Right. I was just, uh, I mean, I don't have a, a settled opinion about this, but some people have thought that like not all pleasure is good because, I mean, you can imagine someone who's just thinking about, like, you don't even have to think about them actually torturing someone. Imagine someone who's like just thinking about uh, raping or torturing or doing terrible things and deriving all this pleasure from thinking about all these things. You might think that that's not good pleasure, that that's like not a good thing that should be happening, at least morally speaking. Maybe the prudential case might be different, but you might think morally speaking that that's not a good thing. Yeah, intuitively it does seem messed up, but in it seems hard for me to like conceptualize the rights. Like, I don't know, and I don't think uh, threshold deontology is like incoherent or anything. Um, I just am trying to see whether it like aligns with my values. Okay, well the thing is, when you just so you know, like whenever you ask the question of like why do you value something, at some point you're it's just going to bottom out and like okay, well I guess I just value it. Right. Like you can or, or you can if you try to say like, oh, well, this is definitionally what I value. Like, oh, utility is definitely what I value. Like a, a, a not be the case. They, it, it, they don't have to bottom out like that. They could be like some kind of infinitist and just lose epistemic. access. Oh, I see. What you're saying. Like, Please don't do that. that. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like and but, if you want to say like, but, oh, but, yeah, sorry, I just want to cr not throw you off though with saying that because regardless, there's gonna be like probably a point where, well, like maybe this doesn't have to happen either. I was gonna say a point where you lose access to like why it's the case, but may, may sorry, maybe that's not the best way to put it. You go on. Obviously. Yeah, I mean, gotcha. if, yeah. if you uh, want to say, yeah. yeah, if you want to say it's like definitionally like part of your values, I don't see why you could say that for utility, but you can't say it for um, deontic reasons. Like a deontologist could just say, well. It's it's just definitionally good, or definitionally within my values to uh, adhere to these rules, yeah, to do like this or not. Yeah, it's, just, it's just more intuitive to me, right? So, like the 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 real question is like, 
if you're if your attack on TD is with respect to grounding, well, grounding isn't you know something that only is an issue for TD, right? You can raise the exact same problem for all the other systems. So it's important for if you want to raise that as a criticism without having it cut against your own presumably utilitarian view, you need to show how your view can answer it, but TD can't, right? Yeah, I think so. So GE Moore, I think this thought goes back to GE Moore, and, and it's in Ross as well. It's the thought is like when it comes to like what's intrinsically valuable, like what fundamentally matters and what's intrinsically valuable, it's hard to think that there could be like any proof that one could give or any line of argumentation that one could give to show that something is intrinsically valuable. It's just, it seems like we just have intuitions about the thing, the sorts of things that matter fundamentally. And I think that like one thing Ross says is that like, look, it seems uh, intuitive that like beneficence is good or like that's a morally nice thing. It seems that like causing harm is not good. Breaking promises doesn't seem very good. Like, he's just, like intuitively these seem like things are just like intrinsically bad. Um, and and it, like what else can we say about it? Like I think like GE Moore, I think one thing he says, he's a kind of like a pluralist consequentialist. And uh, I think that's right. And he says that uh, – like our intuitions about like what's intrinsically good, like we can't like give any further proof for those. It's just like we just have these intuitions about what's intrinsically good, and like there's no, there's no, there's not much more we can say about it. But then when it comes to like our considered judgments about like what sorts of actions are right or wrong, like it's not just intuitions when it comes to that stuff, because there's a lot to think about. There's like lots of values, especially if you're like a value, you know, con or a pluralist consequentialist. You think these, you know, values are going to interact in interesting ways. And, uh, you know, maybe some outweigh others in certain instances. And so there is some argumentation you could give for why, like, one action might be better than another. But it's going to involve appealing to these things that you take to be intrinsically valuable. And that, you know, there's not much more you can say when it comes to asking, like, oh, well, why do you take those things to be intrinsically valuable? Um, it's not clear that there's more that could be said uh, on that matter. Yeah, it's like any any kind of moral argument could have a structure like, you know, if x like um how do you say this like if x is like an instantiation of my values or, or something roughly like that then x is good then you know you say that x whatever it may be is an instantiation of your values then it's good it's like that it's uh, you're saying that like all of the work is going to be kind of on the second premise it's like there's we, we might have these values, we might not be able to explain why we have them, we might have even like an epistemic barrier to, to like, you know, understanding why why we have them or whatever, but if we just grant that everyone has a bunch of values, oh, that's Instacart, sorry. Um, if we just grant everyone has them, there's always this kind of second question when it actually gets to talking about, well, what kind of things are, are good or bad? What kind of real world actions, you know, given these values? Um, there's gonna be this empirical discussion about like, Okay, well, is it is that second premise going to go through that this action does like achieve your values uh, in this case? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I, I guess one more, one other thing to say about this is like like Ross, like Ross, you know, uh, he doesn't say, and he's very clear about this. He's like, look, when it comes to like the sort of duties, like prima facie duties, or the things that you know, the plurality of duties you might have, or you know, um, he says that this isn't the kind of thing that you just come into existence. Like you're just born into the world and you know that like causing harm is wrong. <laughs> he argues that like, look, it takes a lot of time and experience of the world. Like you, like a mature person who like has a lot of experience and goes to the world. Like they eventually come to see that these are the sorts of things that matter that are intrinsically valuable or do matter morally speaking. But it's not like, Oh, this is like a priori in the sense that like, Oh, you just come into the world. And even as a baby, you like already have these intuitions, but no, like it, it does take a lot of time and, you know, moral experience to sort of, you know, have these intuitions about what matters intrinsically and things like this. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah. Th there's something that's always been hilarious to me about just like considering like the a priori knowledge of babies <laughs> like they're like do they have like metaphysical knowledge like <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so cube light maybe we can kind of like sort of say one or two more things and close off this thread with you but like what, the like, big, well we have paper the here big, too actually yeah we'll, we'll let paper on next that's sort of why i was thinking that um i just mean close off the thread with cube light not the whole conversation um mm -hmm. so i guess cube light the one one big takeaway here is understand when your criticism is actually a criticism of td right because if it's a grounding criticism and you can't give some kind of further explanation of why it's a grounding criticism specific to td 
well then you're just raising issues about grounding and that's that's not really like it's not clear what the problem with td is you just have to figure out some stuff about grounding yeah um, again like i i'm not trying to say that td is like incoherent or anything I, it's really I just about that. the grounding for me yeah, okay then but, but yeah but just to be clear you just have an issue about grounding of moral systems generally right it's not specific yeah that's fair enough i guess for... well unless you think there's a symmetry breaker such that the concern only applies to td or like minimally like applies to it doesn't apply to utilitarianism right if you're going to say it well, applies to td and this and that and that like the whole idea is there yeah, has guess... to, it has to apply differentially or else it's just a general like all-purpose grounding concern yeah I guess like uh, a problem of what I was saying earlier with the definition is that that just goes into like saying it's like objectively the case that utility is the thing to be valuing. So I, I see that there's an issue with that. Um, maybe if, if you have like a debate with Cosmic Skeptic one day, um, you can like get into these issues like with his system because um, I think that's where a lot of these issues like bottom out. Well, I did actually, when I talked to him, raise an issue, and I partially pushed him off the position. And if it were a, a kind of different context, I would have pushed more because I think his position here is, doesn't really make sense. Um, but yeah, I did you know, see I, that. I just wish you had like another debate and fleshed it out with him. Well, I, I'm happy to, but um, you know, I don't, I don't know if he's that interested. Um, and you know, what, whatever. But I'm happy to. But yeah, the the whole thing, just to be clear, with cs's view is like he wants to say irreconcilable value differences are impossible uh in virtue of everyone desiring pleasure but it's like well we could go in I, I mean i guess i was about to deliver my whole spiel on it which i'll spare you but like i have a video on this it's called like yeah um, i've seen it i've seen it i understand the point and oh, okay. uh, i really appreciate right. the response you guys um yeah no problem yep yeah. all right okay see you all right okay bye cubelate all right um, all right. Yeah. Paper, uh, unmute yourself and hit us up. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for so much. This, is, this has been a great talk. So, um, I didn't have a lot of questions, but I guess one was the, uh, clarification. Um, earlier in the talk, you mentioned something you were talking about sort of motivations for actions. And you said something along the lines of like, a rule utilitarian would not care about your motivations or you were kind of discussing the importance of uh, praise and blame. And I, I've been thinking about this, I guess, from the perspective of a rule utilitarian and I kind of catch out and I wanted to get your thoughts on if I'm tracking or if I'm wrong here. Um, is hey, can I just interject? Like, I don't think that's what was, I don't think it was being said that a rule utilitarian wouldn't care about what the, um, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I take it to be that um, there's a distinction between judging actions versus people and to judging actions. It's just what the normative theory would say. And to judge the people, it's judging their intentions if they wanted to comport with that normative theory. So a rule utilitarian presumably would judge people um, by in not actions, but people if their intentions would be to comport with rule utilitarianism. Whereas a threshold deontologist would uh, judge people uh, if their intentions were to comport with threshold deontology. Um, and so that would be like a difference, even if all the actions prescribed would be the same, they would still judge people differently uh, because of their motivations. If one w was doing it for rule utilitarian purposes versus one was doing it for threshold deontic purposes. I don't think anyone would take the view that um, rule utilitarians don't um, judge people based on their intentions. They just don't judge actions based on intentions, which is fine. I don't think threshold deontology would judge actions necessarily based on intentions either, but you can certainly in both cases judge people based on intentions. And the intention to judge it is whether or not your actions are, are intended to comport with the normative theory that you hold or a normative theory in question. Does that make sense? I, I think so, but maybe getting back to like the, with the Kant hypothetical. So are you saying that, so in the example, so I think it was the shop owner and the shop owner can lower the price because he, you know, he values, um, you know, he or she values their customer, you know, in yeah. sort of uh, value is based on, you know, human rights and that they're a person or not versus mm -hmm. I I um I am lowering the cost because I know that that will like maximize my profit. Are you saying that a rule utilitarian 
um, although can look at sort of the utilities, they can't sort of say, hey, the norm of doing it because of uh, human rights versus doing it for maximization profit, that's a good norm. I like that norm. And so even though I guess in the act, uh, the util, you know, the utilities might be the same, but I'm in fact sort of promoting the norm of, hey, you're not violating rights. And so I would probably say in my final calculation of like the total utility, I would say the the right, the non-right violating um, sort of shopkeeper is better than the maximizing profit shopkeeper because of the because norm of, of um, uh, the, the rights violation because of the, well, the additional norm. I take it that a really utilitarian would would judge people praiseworthiness or non-praiseworthiness on the basis of their intention of comporting with really utilitarianism. Um, so I think a better example might be you have a shopkeeper and one shopkeeper decides not to inflate his prices on the basis that he um, doesn't want to violate the rights of his customers. That's one shopkeeper. Another shopkeeper um, wants to, does not inflate his, um, does not inflate his uh, prices because he doesn't want to decrease utility generally. He, he thinks that inflating prices would be something that we should make rules against because that would gen generally decrease utility. And then we have a third shopkeeper. And a third shopkeeper decides not to decrease his prices in a shop because A, they would, it would be a violation of the rights of his customers, and B, it would also decrease utility. So the, in, in those three cases of shopkeepers, notice how we have three different intentions behind not raising the prices, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the praiseworthiness of of each individual will be different depending on the normative theory you're operating on. If you're just a deontologist, the most praiseworthy shopkeeper will be the shopkeeper that decides not to raise his prices with the intention of not violating the rights of his customer. If you're just a rule utilitarian, the most praiseworthy shopkeeper will be the shopkeeper that decides not to raise his prices on with the intention of, of uh, comporting to a rule that generally uh, improves utility. If you're a threshold deontologist, the most praiseworthy shopkeeper is the shopkeeper that has concern in his intentions for both. And this is all assuming, of course, that praiseworthiness is cashed out as... Um, comporting was, to the normative were, theory. Right. right. In, in intention. Because you, you, could, you could be a utilitarian, again, you could be this like psychopath who thinks like all these things are good, but like his praiseworthiness is like completely detached from his normative ethics or something like that. But um, yeah, we're taking praiseworthiness to, to be about whether um, whether there's comportion with a normative ethic. Yeah, normative ethic. to the extent that what makes someone praiseworthiness is their intentions of comporting to a given normative ethic, then a threshold deontologist, right. deontologist and really utilitarian would say three different things about all these three shopkeepers right? in terms of their praiseworthiness. Right. Does that make sense, Paper? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, okay. I'm sure you have yep. like 57 other questions, so um, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Do you have anything else yeah. that you want to ask about? Uh, I guess the only thing that I was going to come with a priori was the value plural pluralism question, but I, I kind of like the idea, I think it was, I can't remember who said it, but the idea of like semantic scoping. scoping. That's what, I, yeah, that was my, that was my, just to take credit for that. Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah I was going to say, so, I don't think it was your idea. I think it was your like, you're like, oh, Tyler said it and now I agree with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my wording. That was my wording. Semantic yeah, so, to take yeah, so for me that, that was sort of answered. So I, I don't have anything else. Okay. Um, oh, wait, wait, um, Tyler, Tyler, uh, OH. IO. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. good. That that is the correct moral answer. Yep, uh, maximizes yep. utility. Good old Ohio yep. nerds. Okay, all right. Uh, with that, we'll move you back to the audience. Okay, so if anyone else has anything, you know, hands up now or forever hold your hand down. Um, Avi, did you want to finish your? Uh, we were gonna do some closing words. I said what I want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To say yeah. Well, I just wanna, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. I wanna thank you, especially Tyler. Uh, this has been an awesome talk and. I'll just say a few words about why I, I think threshold deontology, I mean, um, captures my view. I think it's a robust normative theory. I think it aligns very well with my subjective uh, 
ideas and my, and my values um, and preferences. And I think it can be applied in various different situations. And I think it's very intuition friendly. Um, and I think there's, it's a very underrepresented and underappreciated normative theory with a lot of people who um, have a lot of misunderstandings and quite a bit of misrepresentations of the theory out there. And I think most of the criticisms of the theory are just misunderstandings of it. And I hope we've addressed all, as many as we can in this talk. And yeah, thank you so much. And I hope we can do something like this again sometime, Tyler. You, you actually yeah, inspired awesome. me to say one. I want to give you the last word, Tyler. So I, I'll, I'll just say one little thing here, which is um, we should also emphasize that, like, we're not particularly wedded to the idea. And, like, here's why, right? So Avi and I, neither of us are, like, like realists about morality. Like, we both, when we're talking about um, normative ethics, we're just we're just trying to we're picking like a, a normative ethic is just kind of like a, it's like an algorithm for preference description and we just want one that does the best job so even if you find counter examples to threshold deontology you would need to find more of them or at least more weighty ones such that i would think the counter examples for td are like worse than for like util or something like that for me to say oh you know, if you want to get a general sense of my values, look at some other theory, right? So all the, that was a bit of a muddle, but the idea is just we're trying to describe our normative ethics. TD seems to do the best job, certainly does a better job than utilitarianism and virtue ethics than straight up deontology, as far as I'm aware. And if you show a counterexample, it's not going to be like, oh, here's this huge challenge for me. I, what do I possibly do? I'm super committed to TD. It's more just like, well, no, it'd still be the case that TD is the best representation I'm aware of. And I'll just stick to that until I find something better. Um, so yeah, I think that's worth emphasizing. And also just want to say, yeah, huge thanks to Tyler for coming by. This has been uh, very enlightening. Um, it's really great to get some good takes on this stuff and like hear your thoughts on it. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I had a really great time. Um, and if you guys ever want to talk about any other philosophy related stuff again, I'd certainly be open to it. Um, uh, is there anything else I want to say about threshold deontology though i mean i guess well, i mean i sort of said at the outset that like this is a theory that seems to be implicit in a lot of really you know famous philosophers uh views and they're, they're like you know things they say in different papers like thomas nagel for example i'm sure you've heard of nagel he says in uh, i think it's in his paper war and massacre which is you know very widely known uh, at least among philosophers um he says uh at one point he says something like i think that uh that we should certainly adhere to absolutist restrictions unless the utilitarian considerations favoring violation are like overpoweringly weighty and extremely certain. So we see things like that in Nagel. Uh, I think there's some re remarks that Robert Nozick makes and just a few other like really, you know, well-known philosophers who seem to say things that like really suggest that they actually do adopt something like a threshold deontology view. So it's kind of amazing to me that there's not a whole lot of literature that brings it out and examines it in much detail. So uh, I hope that uh, more of that literature uh, kind of appears and then uh, maybe we could read some more of that stuff and talk about it at some future point. If people have interesting things to say about it, who knows? I guess we'll see. <laughs> well, there's this one guy I'm aware of who like occasionally, you know, writes about the topic, um, comes on discord calls here and there. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sounds, sounds familiar. I feel like I've heard of that guy. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, it's awesome talking to you. Maybe we'll, uh, I'll shoot you the video on email once it's up and, uh, yeah, maybe we'll invite you some other time when we're doing philosophy events. Cause you might enjoy also just like listening in on other philosophers too. It's a good little forum for stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, just thanks so much. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Cool. I'm, I mean, I'm in the discord now, right? So I can like see everything. Isn't that right? Yep. I mean, you yep, yep. I mean, turn announcements on if you want to know why everything that's up. Uh, and a lot, a lot of what goes on in here is just crazy people. Uh, trying to defend crazy things but there are there awesome. are good philosophy things here and there. i love that. crazy people defending crazy things it sounds great <laughs> we are the place for you uh okay all right well with that uh we'll just call it a day and just in case you don't know for discord call you have to you have to hang up or else you'll be left in the call forever and people will hear whatever you may be doing over there <laughs> all right cool thanks a lot okay have a good one guys